We're actually about 40 minutes from Destin, but we might go into Destin one day because Sadie and Nora will be in Destin. So, because we'll be with their parents. Yeah. And Claire is going with us. Claire Terry. <laughs> yes. So we're getting a late start. No. So we're getting a late start because the softball coach is keeping them till six. Um, the new softball coach is keeping them until six, so we're getting kind of a late start, but it's okay. It'll be fine. <laughs> we're just going to be still driving at three in the morning, but it's okay. <laughs> We do. We leave Friday night, but my, oops, this is on. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the March 12th Board of Education meeting for Saline Area Schools. I'd like to call us to order. And standing as you are able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Brad Gerby. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, everyone. The superintendent has uh, at least one small group of people to recognize this evening. I certainly do. So it's my honor to introduce the ethics team, the very high achieving ethics team. Anyway, Saline High School's ethics team had its most successful season since the start of the club over 10 years ago. Students in ethics bowl meet after school with Mr. Ornelius and through independently organized practices to formulate arguments over highly complex moral issues. On the weekend of February 3rd, 
Celine's team one, composed of seniors Sarah Youssef, Michael Bryant, Brian Kang, Alex Larson, and Colin Learman, defeated Green Hill, Skyline, Divine Child, and then Ann Arbor Pioneer to win the State Ethics Bowl Tournament. A week later, they defeated a private school from Maryland to win the Divisional Championship and advanced to Nationals. And next month, the team will face some of the top schools in the country at the High School Ethics Bowl National Championship hosted by the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Celine looks to make history by winning the championship and bringing the trophy home. So with that said, we'd like to learn who's on the team and ask for the students and our advisor and he has a special guest as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <clears throat> to come on up to the podium, if you all can come up who are here. And then what we'd like you to do is, uh, first off, you can start by tapping the green button there to make sure that it's on. And we'd like you to introduce yourself, uh, tell us what year in the high school you're at, and then tell us a little bit about your role on the team and uh, just a little bit about your experience and we're all going to do that, and then we're going to go take a picture with the Board of Education over here. So, do, the moms wanna come do you want to go ahead and start? Sure. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Brian King, and I'm a senior here at Celine. And this was our, as a group, this was our first year together. Um, Colin, Alex, Michael, and I, we competed uh, sophomore, junior as well, and it was really fun, and we're really excited to go to UNC this April. So, yeah. Yeah, hi. So, my name is Alex Larson. I'm a senior as well. Um, yeah, no, it was a great experience in general. So, um, one of the things I like the most is kind of grappling with the cases. They give us a I don't know, maybe 15, 18 cases, and give us a period of time to work with them. Um, and it's just, it's great to hang out with these guys. It's a great team. Um, and just take some great stances. So, yeah, I'll pass it on. Hi, my name's Sarah Youssef. I'm a senior. This is my second year in ethics. Um, and I think my favorite part of ethics is probably just finding that gray area rather than um, sticking to a hardcore stance. You really get to discover the complexities of all issues. All right, I'm, uh, I'm Colin Learman. This is the trophy we won. Uh, this is my second year competing, and honestly, my favorite thing is just going to Panera and practicing. <laughs> A little grub, uh, it can't beat it. Uh, I'm Michael Bryant. This is my third year on the team, um, and I guess my favorite part is just hanging out with the squad, uh, having a good time. It's pretty fun. Hi, my name is Zach Ornelas. I go by Mr. O at Celine High School as an English teacher. This is my second year helping to advise this team, uh, carrying on the torch from Shelly Venema, who started this as a founding team in Michigan 10 years ago in 2014 in the first Ethics Bowl. So it's really cool to, to honor what she started and to see these kids uh, go to the national championship where I'd like to point out that a majority of the schools competing there are private schools that cost a whole lot of money and to take public school there and to hopefully beat all of them is a, a huge honor and just kind of a testament to the education at Celine High School. So, thank you. Okay. Let's give them a hand. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, and then if we can, uh, Ms. Martin, we'll take a picture. Let's all head over to the side area and let's take a picture. We are working at getting this down to a real science. <laughs>
Board Recording Secretary Yang Ki. Are there any public comment cards? Thank you. I think we can run the rest of this meeting without Brian Gerby. I, what do you? Brad. Oh, Brad, Brad Gerby, or or Brian Gerby. I don't care. Did you know that that was like the 50/50 for the Well, I will not discuss that. There are no uh, public comments in the queue, so we'll skip past that. We do have one extended public comment from Celine Middle School's uh, Kimberly Jasper, A.K.A. Kim Jasper. AKA Principal Jasper and Lindsay Gunter, Assistant Principal. Thank you for having us this evening. I'm Kim Jasper. I'm the proud principal of Celine Middle School. I'm Lindsay Gettner, proud prin assistant principal of Celine Middle School. We're honored to stand here today and highlight all of the fantastic successes and experiences of our learning community. Spring at a middle school brings all sorts of uh, eventful days. Um, along with fantastic events, celebrations, assessments, and opportunities that will culminate our year of learning. To get us started at SMS, we have some remarkable musical talent. Our students and their skilled teachers have been displaying those talents through band, choir, and orchestra performances. And in a collaboration of visual and auditory arts, the eighth grade band created visual representations of the characters that were presented in their musical performances. Examples include the Mad Prince and the Dark Queen. Our drama students also showcase their creative commitment to the performing arts through school-based and evening performances of the scripts they developed. Athletically, our wrestling team concluded its season with the uh, Junior Draws Tournament, showcasing the determination and sportsmanship integral to being a Celine Hornet. Additionally, the girls' basketball teams recently wrapped up their season, which was particularly successful for eighth graders who led a series of wins against the SEC competition. Keeping with the spirit of teamwork and commitment evident in our teams, our student leaders in Web and Student Council dedicated their time to welcoming and preparing incoming students at the 6th and 7th grade information nights. They were well spoken and demonstrated the excellent peer mentoring that exists at SMS. Our students at SMS are expressing a plethora of talents through our diverse range of clubs, from our service-oriented Builders Club to empowering groups like Girls Who Code, GSA, and FCA, to sharpening their academic skills with math counts. There's something for every student at SMS. Additionally, our UNO Club fosters communication skills in a fun and interactive way, ensuring that every student can find their niche and thrive. The achievements coming out of these clubs are truly remarkable. Perhaps you've also heard of our Science Olympiad and Robotics teams. Science Olympiad had several students in the top 10 in their February competition at U of M, and our three robotics teams have outshined the competition across the state, with our SMS Cybugs heading off to Texas to compete in the world competition in April. Let's not forget about academics, of course. The SMS Hornets continue to display excellence in multiple facets of their education. Building wide, our students had the opportunity to display and compete in experimental science learning at the SMS Science Fair. Experiments included, but were not limited to, the impact of different sugars when growing crystals, proving which kind of wood burns the longest and hottest if you want to build the best bonfire, and which insulation keeps steady for the longest period of time. Perhaps the most delicious of these science fair uh, experiments as we head into the se season of marshmallow peeps is which liquid will dissolve them the fastest. So we have some students who could tell you that. Students at each grade level found ways to solve problems through hypothesis, research, data collection and analysis, and final presentations. Further learning experiences included a seventh grade visit to the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology, an exploration of world religions. Our eighth grade students presented e-cyber mission presentations um, Science fair S with a little bit of an additional component to school administration. Dr. Lotch and I both sat and received these presentations and questioned the students on their processes. Sixth grade students researched for the cross-curricular and multi-genre national parks project. 
and students are learning to put their perspectives to the paper through argumentative writing and revision. On a note of advocacy, our student council is organizing a Rock Your Socks Day at Buzz's Biz for World Down Syndrome, showcasing the compassion and awareness that our students are fostering within the school environment. Lastly, very proud of this, our students are actively participating in a school-wide competition to bring the most cereal boxes um, to school in their first hours for Slanery Social Services. The SMS Domino of Kindness featuring cereal dom a cereal domino track set up and knocked over by our winning students and leaders symbolizes the positive impact that our clubs can collectively achieve. I do have to put in a plug. There is an Amazon link that lives on social media. We are over 500 boxes. We want more because we want to make it all the way around the track. So plug for everyone to purchase cereal if you want. The competition is fierce at SMS <laughs> across first hours for those cereal boxes. And if you want a moment of nostalgia, just go peek in our storage room. Uh, Mrs. G and I commend our SMS students and staff for their achievements in the academics, the arts, athletics, and community giving. We're continuously impressed with the ways that our students are respectful, responsible, safe, and kinder than necessary. Thank you to each of you for your continued support and encouragement as our students, students strive for excellence. Go Hornets. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wish we could ask questions, and, and but you know, extended public comment. We won't do that. I have no response to uh, last week's public comment. Uh, so I, at this point, I would like to entertain um, a motion to approve the agenda as printed or revised. Let me just give a little background. Items can be added or deleted from the agenda, or the order can be changed at the request of an individual board member or the superintendent. The agendas must be approved before proceeding further. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion. Kirby. Kirby. Uh, second, Stebbin. Stebbin. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, Se it's seven, right? Yeah. Okay, good. So, thank you very much. Um, we do have one student showcase tonight. Would you like to introduce them, please, uh, Caroline, if that's all right? Do I surprise you with this? <laughs> no, you're all good. All right. um, tonight's student showcase is the Slane High School Science Olympiad team with Suhani, um, Ayush, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, but Weirin Yang. Thank you. All right, you guys can come on up here and for your showcase to the podium. Thank you. Hi, I'm Monica C. I'm the coach for our high school science Olympiad team, and I'm very proud to be here with our three captains this season. I have Ayush Reddy, Suhani Dalela, and Alice Young. And uh, before I let these students tell you about their accomplishments, I think what we would like you all to know, what I would like everyone to know, is about how much work our students do in order to perform at the level they perform at. So. They'll tell you about the events, but we have 23 of them, and so they learn about fossils, they learn about microbes and diseases and forestry and, um, oh, I said diseases already, anatomy, ecology, the planet, uh, exoplanets, so all sorts of things these students learn about. They do experiments in chemistry and in physics. They build these engineering wonders. They build airplanes, they build launchers, they build wheeled vehicles, they build robots, they build detectors. Um, so the level that our team performs at, it I just cannot overstate or be a prouder coach of the amount of time energy, effort, discipline, and study, and sustained effort it takes for them to be able to, our season goes the entire year, for them to still be bettering themselves and their teammates at this point in the season, after a whole season of it so far. Um, it takes a lot of grit from our students, so I'm very proud of them, and I will let them share their slides with you. And one more. <laughs> All right. So the things that we're going to go over tonight are we're going to talk to you about our team, Science Olympiad. We'll talk to you about the team events that we participate in. We'll talk to you about our year so far and how it's been going, our Hawk and Hornet tournament that we run with Troy Athens, and our future plans. So right now we'll first go over, like, what is Science Olympiad, what are some topics, and how we organize our team. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> so to start off, we have 23 events in a variety of different topics. Um, we've got life and pers life, personal and social sciences, um, earth and space sciences, physical science, chemistry, technology, engineering, inquiry, and nature of science as well. And these are split up into study and build events. So study events involve students, you know, either memorizing material or creating binders and note sheets full of just, you know, just a lot of facts, you know, and that could be what are the type of um, rocks out there, you know, or how are diseases spread. And um, so the students will take the test on that. And, you know, they could, again, like I said, they could have note sheets or binders with them as well, or it's all in their head. Um, additionally, we have build events where students make things like air trajectories to, you know, accurately hit a target or um, get a ball in a bucket. And um, we have students kind of evenly split out across these events. Um, additionally, uh, we have eight tournaments in a season and we have 34 students on our team. Um, each student is, can be in anywhere from two to six events. And we hope that students are not in six events because that is a really long tournament day. <laughs> but, um, you know, we're split all across these 23 events and we cover them pretty well, I would say. Next, we will talk to you about the team events that we participate in throughout the year. So, um, in, in order to have a more inclusive environment where everyone is comfortable and to really build a community since we are a team, we do do a lot of team bonding events throughout our season. For example, in the summer, we did a Jeopardy game and there was a couple topics. There's like movies about Science Olympiad, history, music, crime, and um, team trivia. So for example, who's the tallest team member in the, in the team? And maybe, <laughs> just maybe. Um, and then in August, we also did a picnic event with the Selene Middle School. Um, we were able to like talk with them. It was very fun, but this also gave them a chance to see what it would be like to actually be in the high school team. Lastly, we did do a gingerbread house competition in, in like December. So one, a couple of our members set that up and it was really fun. And you can see like, maybe they're very small, but there's like some gingerbread houses there and we had like a little board and like judge all the houses. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So, oh, oh again, <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about our year, the placements that we've gotten so far, um, the tournaments that we compete in throughout the year and we will be competing in um, uh, coming this year and how we did last year as well. So some of our placements last season were that at regionals we got second place and at states we got ninth place. Some highlights from last year were that we won over 200 medals total we got our own place in the STEM building and we had our own social events like kayaking and we had an ice cream social. So now um, this is kind of our timeline. Um, this is just our major competitions we will do. So we have Hawk and Hornet, that's our first tournament and we run this actually with Troy Athens. So this also helps us get a little bit more funding and we'll definitely talk more about that in a couple, in a few, um, a bit later. And then we do have a U of M tournament and a lot of national teams attend this tournament and it really helps us kind of like gauge where we are at and what can we improve on. It's a very helpful tournament we go to. And then Allendale, it's mainly we go there to run our build events. They have really nice facilities we do that for. And um, we won first place a couple weeks back. So that was very nice. Regionals is this Saturday. So our team is actually meeting right now to cram in everything and we've been um, doing a lot of work for that. And then states will be on May 4th, so Star Wars Day, and it'll be pretty fun. All right, so some of the placements that we've already gotten this year, um, unfortunately at, well, Hawk and Hornet, since we run that with Troy Athens, um, and that's where it was this year, um, we don't award trophies to ourselves or for them since we're one of the organizing teams. So nothing there, but I would say we did pretty good. <laughs> um, at U of M, we got 12th place just this February. At Northview, which is one of our earlier tournaments, we got seventh place. Um, at Hazlitt, we got fourth place. Solon, which is another tournament with um, some national teams, one of them came all the way from Texas. 
Um, we got ninth place there. And finally, at Allendale, our main team took first, and um, our alternate team took seventh. In addition to our in-person tournaments, we also participate in Battle of the States, which is a online tournament between states in the Midwest region. And we've placed very well. We got first place in Chem Lab, first and fourth place in Optics, and first place in Detector Building, among very various other placements. So now we will transition to our Hawk and Hornet competition. So this was actually our third year doing this competition and hosting. Um, this was at Troy Athens, and next year we will be hosting at the Saline High School. So Hawk and Hornet is important to us for um, many reasons. One reason is since that we're organizing it with Troy Athens, it brings in a lot of funding from the fee that teams pay in order to participate. Um, it also puts us on the map, um, even though we are a very good team. Um, you know, we want to be put on the map for sponsors and other teams and anyone who can support us generally. So hosting a tournament does that. Um, it is actually, I would say, the earliest tournament in the Science Olympiad season. So we have a lot of teams um, from all over the state and actually Ohio too, I think. Um, coming to participate and you know see where are their members at you know how are they doing and just kind of see how we all stand up against each other and I would say it's a lot of fun too since it's early you know not super high stakes um, like uh, we mentioned earlier it was hosted at Troy Athens this year um, and since we alternate back and forth it will be hosted at Celine if for the 2024 tournament uh, we had 44 participating schools this year, which is almost double the number from when we first started. So I would say, you know, we're growing pretty well. And um, it's run by our very own former coach, Coach Noth, as well as Coach Eric and Elaine from uh, Troy Athens. And finally, we're going to finish off by telling you about our future plans. So going to our future plans, we have... Our first plan will be gaining more members. Sorry. Gaining more members. Um, a lot of the students actually don't really know about us, um, even though they are very interested in various science fields, such as biology, engineering, et cetera. And um, but this is why we really want to increase our advertisement in the school, maybe like putting up flyers and talking to teachers. Um, we will also do an open house event and also use social media. Um, we've started posting on social media during all our events, and hopefully that will also gain more traction. Number two, we hope to utilize the STEM building. It'll be very long before we will actually be able to use it, but we are really excited for the chance to. Um, it would be very helpful for our build events. For example, like flight, we have to go all the way to the gym and kind of like fly these planes and Sometimes it doesn't work based on the heights and there's always like basketball nets and it could be dangerous for our planes. Um, also labs would be very helpful. We do have a couple, but in our other room, some of the labs don't really work, which could hurt a lot of our team since you can't really do full on labs. Um, and then we hope to have use those um, collaborative workspaces in the building. Um, since we have 23 events, we have like smaller team breakouts and it would be very helpful to use that. So that is our, those are our kind of plans. Thank you so much for listening. This team means a lot to us. Um, Ayush and I being seniors and Alice almost there. Um, so this, it's had a huge impact on us and we've loved being part of it throughout the years. Thank you. Well, well yay, thank you. Well done and congratulations. Thanks for staying up. There may be a question or two. I guess I would just like to start quickly by saying your gingerbread houses must have been highly engineered, right? <laughs> Structurally sound, withstand you know, a lot of weight and whatever. But, um, did you ever manage to sort out the air conditioning issues for your flights in the gymnasium? Yes, Rex Cleary helped us with that this season, so we haven't had any problems using the oxygen this season has been great. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Anyone else at the table? I can work up, down. Go ahead. So, um, just a quick comment. So first of all, um, 
you know, I, every time I see Science Olympiad and robotics, and I'm just super excited about our future here in Saline and the bond and the things that we're going to be able to do and provide for facilities for you guys so you won't have to worry about hopefully about air conditioning and having that impact here. So I'm, I'm really excited for that and thankful for that. Uh, I continue to be appreciative of the fact that you have a partnership with Troy Athens. Uh, it's somewhat selfish because I am a Troy Athens Red Hawk. So for me, it's like a, um, it's a full circle moment for me, right? So uh, best of both worlds, if you will. And then I always ask this question of groups that, that join us, and you've hit on a couple of things with regards to advertising and what have you, but um, how can the board help you? Like what can, what can we do specifically to, to support you? Because the floor is yours, right? This is always a tough question. Uh, what keeps me up at night is the coach funding keeps me up at night. So all of these pieces, all of these beakers and uh, note sheets to put all of their reference materials in and uh, circuit boards that they need for their detectors and the airplane kits, all of these things are very expensive as well as the travel fees. And so um, I would say that that's something that I wrestle with as the coach. Um, and I'm very excited to hear that the new facility is going to be breaking ground on March 22nd. And so I will be there at the groundbreaking. I'm very, very excited about it as a coach. Um, and I'm looking forward to the district partnering with us to find out what is the best way that we can utilize the space, any spaces that are available to us for storing things. Um, when I was at Solon, um, at the beginning of February, I learned that they have an entire classroom that is only Science Olympiad storage. It's not even a room that they use for their meetings. It's just for storage so that if they want to bring out a scrambler device that rotated out, you know, six years ago, they can just pull it out of the archives and blow the dust off. And now they have a place to start for their season. And that's something that is has been difficult for us traditionally because all of our building is currently happening in kids' basements. And, um, and the team doesn't retain any of those devices when they go because we don't have space to store them. So, um, so I'm just looking forward to some of those discussions as we move forward. We have a design meeting coming up with Kara Davis. Um, so we're just really grateful for any, any partnership that the district gives to us. We're so grateful. Um, to the three of you and also um, especially our two seniors who probably have some some ideas moving forward but how has this experience influenced your post high school decision making and future um, goals um, I think science Olympiad since I've been in it since like elementary school essentially I've been in it for almost like eight to eight years yeah so I think my experience with Science Olympiad is that it's really gotten me into like engineering and science and all that. It kind of inspired me to take a lot of classes that I did in high school. And it's also inspired my college decision making. I have gotten to U of M and I'm planning on going, in, going there for engineering. So I think Science Olympiad has been the biggest impact on my life. I have also been in Science Olympiad since it started here when I was in fourth grade. Um, I think as a girl, I get told a lot that, you know, science, engineering, not really your thing. And I know from being in Science Olympiad, because, I mean, I haven't really been in any other similar, um, you know, clubs or organizations where I get to kind of explore. Um, I've really gotten to see, like, what are my options? You know, like, oh, I could go into medical. Oh, I could go into engineering, you know. Uh, I could go and hear all the different types of engineering, right? So I think it's really impacted um, to help me decide what I want to do after high school. Um, it's also been a huge part of my college application. Um, I've devoted a lot of time to it. Um, I have also gotten into U of M and Georgia Tech, and um, I think that without Science Olympiad, I don't think I would have, you know, been able to say, this is what I want to do, and I'm going to do it just because I can. These guys are fantastic. Ayush has built a wheeled vehicle that it has an egg on the front and it gets so close to a plywood within millimeters without breaking the egg. So that's the kind of engineering that he's been doing and um, and Suhani's been really great. I, mean, I just, I love them both, so. We'll miss them. Well, 
other comments down the table? No, I'll no, no, go ahead. I'll just follow up uh, the last students. What was your name again? Yeah. Uh, Suhani. Suhani. Um, I know that no Salinary Schools teacher has told you that you can't do anything, and I'm sure that um, I'm sure that you you might hear that in your life. But remember that you can do whatever you want to do. Anyone can do whatever they would like to do. Um, particularly in Women's History Month, I just wanted to call that call that out. And uh, very proud of all of you and the rest of your team. And thank you, Monica, for the coaching. Well, thank you. Well, thank you all thank very you much. So I much. appreciate it. We'll see you next year with the big trophies and everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right thank you. Before we get to our scheduled reports, we have three quick, hopefully quick action items. Uh, the first is action A. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the February 27th, 2024 closed session for the purpose of collective bargaining 8C of the Open Meetings Act. And uh, for those of you who are new to this process, Secretary Miller is handing out those minutes and we'll give a quick review of them and do a vote. First of all though, so moved. do we, thank you. <laughs> You're right on top of it, J.S. Kirby, second. BG, thank you very much. Or is it maize and blue? It is. Mm. Yeller and blue. With regards to Miranda? Yeah. Um, I think so. I think it's out of order slightly. So I would, if, if we would like to, we can just have that, that section there at the bottom um, put up under number three since it's part of the same grouping. Yeah. yeah. I don't disagree with the content. <laughs> So Michael, I just moved to um, make a motion to approve with changes, with um, pulling that up under number three and then the deletion of the adjournment time, which is a duplicate. So we'll say as revised. Yep. And I still second. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Well, that's fine, unless you don't trust us. I don't trust you. All opposed? Zero. Uh, abstentions? One. Right, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, my bad. <laughs> right. uh, I'd like to also uh, entertain a motion to approve the 2024-2025 School of Choice guideline as recommended by Superintendent Lodge. <coughs> so moved. Is that Lauren? Thank you. Kirby, second. Three for three. Any discussion on this, Dr. Lodge, or questions? Well, go ahead. <coughs> so this is um, to try to make policy language match our current guidance that we've been publishing to the community for years and years. 
and the state um, or the what what legislation and the legal language says about a specific item within this policy. Currently, we list um, students may may be removed from consideration if they have been suspended from school in the past two years, if they were ever expelled from school, uh, or convicted of a felony. The language in the policy says enrollment is not available to these students. Language uh, from legislation also says students may be removed from consideration. So I'm suggesting we should follow the language that is in the um, legal um, definition, so to speak. Yeah, so in, in the policy report, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that and that'll be um, coming forward to an agenda soon. <laughs> this particular um, discussion item is about the number. Steve is just um, previewing. Yeah, th yeah th right, this is, a, <laughs> this is not about the number. This is just making the language of the policy consistent with um, guidance, for our local guidance, and what it uh, says in legislation language. Thank you. Are there any other questions to ask Dr. Lotch about this? Yeah, so I think I think there, because there's two school of choice items on the agenda. So right now we're discussing the numbers and the guidelines for those numbers, but also a part of those guidelines are the policy, which we will be bringing forward. Yes, exactly. Because there's language on this. <coughs> exactly. Exactly. So they're related, but... Yeah, so we'll be discussing it further, so there'll be two school of choice items. So we're looking at the document from the last board meeting? Yes, okay. currently. Yep, I think Steve was just saying when it comes up again later, <laughs> they oh, are I related. Mean, yeah, that. yeah, that's okay. Pages five and so the motion is about the numbers, just to be clear as to what we're actually voting on, right? Okay. Approve the document that's on page six of the packet. Six and seven. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Did you want to talk further about it? Well, sure. I can just explain. Yep. Sorry about that. I was going out of turn with with the order, but the the specific numbers. Just um, basically, philosophy is more taking students at the youngest levels, um, not taking students in fourth through eighth grade, and then taking some students again at the high school level. That's what this, th these numbers <laughs> propose um, for School of Choice for this upcoming year. Question. Um, have, have these numbers changed from um, when we reviewed the draft last meeting? Okay, I just wanna make sure. The, well, there is one small change in that um, first, second, and third grade now match the minimum one number, which was sort of an error that we had before without, with saying second grade had zero. So um, minimum one, and again, minimum means that we need to take at least one student, but we could take more. Thank you. Great, then all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? Aye. Here, Tim. Oh, right. Okay. Thank you. 6 1. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the purchase from Dow's equipment sales and service for two lifts and subsequent, subsequent removal and reinstallation of the existing lifts at the new operations center for a total of $57,659, as recommended by Rex Clary, Executive Director of Operations. Support, Miller. Okay. Second. Tim. Tim Austin, thank you very much. Is there anything to add to this uh, or any? No? It's pretty straightforward. Questions for Mr. Clary? Well then, hearing none, let's put it to a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, six one. Uh, seven, two. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two scheduled reports this evening. The first will be the Community Education Department update uh, presented by the Community Ed staff members. Thank you. you. The floor is yours. All right. here. Thank you. This is the thing.
All right. Well, thank you, uh, Mayor Ann Almeis, Brian Puffer, and the Community Education Director uh, for Sling Community Ed. Uh, last time we presented, it's probably about 10 years ago, and I think we took about an hour, so it's probably we would have been asked back, I'm guessing. So we'll make sure we go a little quicker this time. I know we have a lot of slides on there. So basically today we want to do is kind of give you an overview of what we do, who we are, and whatnot. So first what I'd like to do is kind of go through, and uh, a lot of my staff are here tonight, so I'd like to introduce them, and I'm just going to have them stand up when I say their name. Uh, first would be my administrative specialist, Sharon Dunny, who's been with us for 23 years. Second would be our aquatics program specialist, Sandy Stafford, who's been for us 20 years. Lisa Barrio, who is not here, who's been here longer than anybody in the community, has been with us for 26 years in the program. They started in 1990 with the program, I believe, in 91. Check my math. Next is Rebecca Greeb, our cultural arts specialist. She's been with us 20 years. Our next one is Linda Davis, who is our design specialist. She is not here tonight, but she has been with us for 12 years. Uh, next is our early childhood service director, Sue Finlin, who's been here 18 years. Uh, her facility specialist, Jeff Berman, who's been here with us 23 years. Our Liberty Club director, Shannon Macy, who has been with us here for eight years. I'm gonna get her name wrong. And then our recreation enrichment program specialist, Ashley Howe, who's been here with four years. So as you can see, we have, this is our full-time staff, and we have 125 uh, full-time full and part-time staff together, and our average years of service is about 17.4 years. So something we're, we're proud of to have a consistent department. Uh, really quick, kind of what, what is community education? Sometimes people ask what that is. Um, and you can, I'm not gonna read the top paragraph to you, but you can read that over. Uh, but the bottom is our mission statement, in, in which is the mission of community ed is to deliver community education services of the highest quality to Slane Area School District. And I believe our staff behind us does that every day. Uh, first, what I do is kind of read over some highlights from the last year, and then we will go over each department. Uh, if you have questions for them, feel free to stop me and ask. Like I said, it's just kind of the highlights of what we have done. Uh, first of our highlights I really want to bring to attention is McKay, which is the Michigan Adult Community Alternative Education Association. Last fall at the conference, we received the 2023 Program of the Year Award. Out of 50 applicants, we are selected for the men's high school volleyball team. You may or may not know it's, start, it's a community, edu community education program that we started two years ago. Uh, and one of the main factors we were chosen for that award is because if we didn't provide that program, start that program, it wouldn't exist. And that team in its second year of existence went to the final four, right, Ashley? <laughs> so we're very proud of that. Hopefully soon it will become an MHSA sport, but uh, we're very proud of that program. Uh, another one is the creation of the eSports team at the high school. Uh, we work with Steve Asloff to get the program started. So we're, we're very excited that first season's going very well. Uh, I know they were here presented at the board, and so we're excited for the spring season. It's kicking off. Uh, our November craft show, you may or may not know that we are part of uh, the craft show. Last November was our uh, highest attendance we've had since 2008. That's when I became director, uh, looking at numbers, but we are very excited about that. Another highlight is the COVID transition. Uh, obviously when COVID happened in 2020, we were the first department to have students back in the building. Um, we were kind of just like the guinea pigs to see how this is all gonna work and whatnot. So I told Lee in the middle of June, we gotta go back to camp. But don't call it camp, just call it kids coming to the school and they're going to be in pods of 10. And so uh, we were excited to do that and we actually ran that whole summer camp without one case of COVID uh, in 2020. Uh, 35 new programs were implemented last year. Uh, so for a couple of the highlights, we implemented, uh, implemented Bridge 4. Uh, it's for all incoming fourth graders uh, uh, at Heritage. We had 129 kids participate in that program last year. Uh, kind of give them a three-day crash course of what Heritage School is going to be like. It's taught by Heritage uh, teachers. Uh, we have a Bridge 6 program that we've been doing at the middle school for, gosh, about eight years now that we've modeled after that. Uh, another one that we're um, very proud of is that we implemented a school-wide facility software, LEO, if you heard it. Uh, everybody in the district uses it. We know, we can tell you um, a good example of how important it is to have this is Last year when we had, um, unfortunately, the shooting over here in the summertime, we had kids at the middle school. We knew exactly who was there, where they were, um, and so we were able to contact the instructors right away, have them move to safety, and so having everybody on the same page, athletics, buildings and grounds, and us, it's worked out really well. And the last one is, uh, if you may or may not know, we do control the community garden, we oversee that, and we uh, updated that as well, and so we'll hit on that a little bit later. 
Uh, the first one we're going to run to is uh, aquatics, and Sandy's here. We're just going to go over the highlights of that program. Uh, it's home to the Selene swim team uh, with 225 plus athletes, 50 plus USA state qualifiers, 12 sectional, and seven NCSA qualifiers. We have nine swim groups to meet the needs of all levels of swimming. Uh, it's a, we are coordinated the largest feeder program for youth running. I know you see why is that in there because it's aquatics. It's because Sandy's in charge of that too. <laughs> and so uh, we do have a great program, uh, both of those. And you know, Sandy has been instrumental in all those programs since 2004, even longer for the running. Uh, we're known for outstanding meet operation facility and event experiences. Uh, we don't have a lot of free weekends for rentals, but when we do, we have them full. Um, and then obviously for all the athletic events that take place in the pool, everything that takes place in the pool, Sandy and her staff uh, oversee those events. Uh, like I mentioned, we are highly sought after rental and high school facility, Michigan. And another thing is too, we're proud of, again, back to COVID, is we created uh, the Back to Swim COVID transition program with USA Swimming, designing a unique COVID um, running plan as well. Uh, next, before and after care, uh, we currently have 300 enrollments across our four programs. Uh, currently, right now, we run Heritage and Woodland Meadows together at Woodland Meadows. Um, that's due to staffing. Staffing's getting better, but it's not back to where, where we need it. Uh, we draw from all walks of life. We're kind of proud of this. We have high school students now, college students, paras, uh, child care workers, providing children with a range of personalities and their caregivers. And so we think that's very important to have that. Uh, we pride ourselves in providing a safe, active, and fun space for busy families and children both before and after school and during the summer. Uh, Lee wrote this and filled this in, so it's not me, but this was from Lee. He said, I have been with the program since the summer of 1990. If you were a 10-year-old then, you are now 40 years old. <laughs> and yes, we have and are currently serving the children of children we served decades ago. Yeah. We were talking and Lee's like, I need to come up with something. I said, talk about how long you've been here. It's been forever and talk about all the kids you had. And he came up with that and I thought that was really good. So, uh, Cultural arts. Uh, in the past 20 years, nearly uh, 3,000 students in grades one through eight have participated in the Youth Theater Guild, Junior Theater and Broadway Boot Camp. I think that's very amazing that we've had 3,000 students come through there. We've been proud that the kids can start as young as uh, first grade. In, in those programs and stay in it through high school if they like. Uh, maintenance, scheduling, and staffing for our three district theater spaces for year-round school and community group, concerts, recitals, uh, theatricals, business pr presentations, and church services. We're lucky to have three theater spaces in this district and we do use all three. People sometimes think Liberty our th Auditorium there just sets there, it does not. We use it, we rent it out to our church every Sunday. Um, so their spaces do get used and Rebecca and her team do a great job of making sure those spaces are used, but they're also that they're maintained and they're not abused. Um, it's also one of the most highly in demand rental spaces in southeastern Michigan for performing arts due to the well, like what I just said, the well-maintained facilities. Uh, anybody that sees that theater, you know, it's beautiful. It's 20 years old, but it's still, it's one of the best spaces, theater spaces in the state. Uh, this is very important. Technical theater training opportunities and stage management and sound and light board development for SH students. That's Hornet Light and Sound. That's correct, right? Uh, it gives these students an opportunity to work in the theater while they're still in high school, uh, which is amazing. And then that day, Rebecca has had students go on and, and further their careers in college and go work and then come back and work for us. So for those students that have that opportunity to work in that space um, is phenomenal. And Rebecca does a great job with those kids. Um, and then also, we are one of the first theater spaces in Washtenaw County to reopen after COVID uh, with film, live stream, limited capacity performances, and in-person youth theater classes. I will say, we were told to go back when Scott was here, and so we're going back in these spaces. That's why we are in those spaces. And we had to come up with plans, and as you guys know, in 2020, some of the stuff we're making up and seeing what we could do. Um, but uh, it worked well. We had some clients that came to us just because nobody else was open, and we retained some of those clients. Early childhood, it's been operating in the Sling community for over 45 years. Uh, from four, 2014 to 2044, we provided early childhood programs for over 1,000 families. Programs include the Great Start Readiness Program, preschool, pre-K, and summer camp. Since 2014, the program earned an average of 4.8 out of 5 on a quality program indicator. Uh, in 2024, the program earned a certificate of recognition for demonstrating quality early childhood programs from the department of education great start office. 
Uh, Sue Fenn does a great job of this program. Uh, what's phenomenal about it is staffing. Obviously, we do have turnover. Sometimes we used to joke we were the minor league system. We'd have a teacher for a year or two, then they become a kindergarten teacher and first grade teacher, uh, which is great, uh, again. But and so she's been able to retain that staff, train that staff, and we keep operating a great program that's been being recognized. Uh, we operate the only Great Start Reno's program in Saline. The program is designed to provide high quality preschool ch to children at risk for low educational attainment in the school year before they are eligible for kindergarten. I will say that Great Start Readiness program is amazing. You see them when the kids first get there into the year and then you see them at graduation down at Mill Pond Park. Uh, it's really nice to see how much those kids grow and watch them. Uh, the last one's a quote from one of our parents. What I like the most about the program as a parent are the activities they make learning fun. I've seen my child's growth in problem solving, conflict resolution with friends because the staff helps them to work through it. All children get individual help whenever needed. Uh, next one is our facilities to go over this. Uh, we used to have one person that was in charge for facilities at Community Ed. In 2020, that person uh, uh, left Community Ed and now we have, uh, I would say, one, two, three, five, about four of us that go over it. We meet once a week to go over everything in, in the district. So we have, we, it's a team approach and it's worked out really well. Um, and so you can see we've had 10,000 plus facilities requests processed since implementing LEO in 2022. Uh, 500 group individual facility counts. Uh, our rental revenue for the calendar year last year was just over 300,000. Um, like I just mentioned, our staff meet weekly to discuss, review, and plan for district-wide facility usages. We meet every Thursday at two o'clock. My staff will tell you it's my favorite meeting of the week. Uh, we go over everything in the district, not just community ed, but everything that's in there. So if we see a conflict, even if it's not ours, we'll look at it. We'll call the necessary people and make sure that we have it uh, we know what's going on, but it's also a testament to everybody, you know, in athletics or clubs, Lori Dawson's Boys and Grounds, everybody's using the system, so it's working the way it should. Uh, we do get a lot of uh, feedback. We do survey our, our clients. That's just uh, another comment down there. Uh, we love our relationship with Slim Schools. We've been running our events here for five years now. The process for serving is easy and staff and facilities are first class. I would recommend running any events with Slim Schools. We look at facilities as a way to bring people into our district to see our facilities that maybe wouldn't come here. So we do host a lot of tournaments for uh, you know, basketball, uh, we'll have football rentals. We have a lot of different things on our site. So we figure if we can get people here, you know, maybe they wanna come to school here, maybe it's the first time they've seen Celine. So we have other motives just to, obviously we wanna make money, but we wanna have people in the district. Our next one is Liberty Club. Started in 2011. Um, I was here still, I was here, and we had two parents that came up and said, we wanna run a program because we have nothing to do for our two kids. Once they turn 27, they are no longer eligible for the young adult program. I said, if you wanna try it, let's try it. And so the first year we had four people, we had four participants. You can see now we have 32 participants and we have a long wait, we have a waiting list, um, which is, is, is phenomenal. It's the largest program for disabled adults, 26 and older in Washtenaw County. It provides continuous learning, life skill and development and social interaction. Uh, we partner with 19 different local organizations for volunteer and social integration. We delivered 700 plus meals in partnership with Selene Meals on Wheels in 2023. Uh, we plan to expand services to meet the growing community need. Uh, one neat um, thing too is that our, obviously our youngest is 27 and our oldest participant is 58 years old in the program. So it's, we have a wide range of um, ages in our program. Next one is Reckoning Enrichment, uh, programming for grades K through 12. Uh, fall 2023, going into spring, we've offered 195 different program courses, 399 with courses between Rec, Adult Rec, Youth Enrichment, High School, Adult Enrichment, Youth Arts and Crafts, and Youth Music Theater. Uh, we view and operate our program to be a feeder program to continue where the kids are at middle school and high school. Uh, we're proud to have you know our junior tackle football program, our travel programs. Um, we're looking at bringing, trying to have maybe like an esports team that's you know in middle school programs. So we're trying to do, develop programs that can be feeder programs for other things, not just athletics, but everything else. And so uh, Ashley does a really good job with that. We offer the most middle school sports that I know anybody around between uh, our athletic department and our community ed department. So we keep trying to work on that. We have a great partnership with the consortium and athletics. We run our summer camps through them each school year. It's another way for us to kind of promote the programs to our students in the middle school. 
and whatnot for the consortium classes. They've been phenomenal. Uh, and athletics, again, has always been a great partner of community ed. We continue to look for new programming offers. We evaluate the needs and wants of the community, but also taking pride in the fact that we have programs that have been offered through us for 20 years. People come to us with programs they want to run. We also keep up on the trends and see what's out there. So if there's a need in the community and we can run it, uh, we're going to try it. Our last one, or getting to the end here, is our community garden. As you may or may not know, it's located uh, between Woodland Meadows and Weber Bliss. We uh, kind of renovated this. Uh, we created an online registration. We established a garden agreement. Uh, we provide water, new compost uh, annually, replace the deteriorating sign out front, if you may have noticed. Um, to meet the demand this year, we've, we're adding five additional plots. I think we had maybe probably what, 10 people on the wait list last year. And so it's turned into a really nice spot. It always has been. We kind of neglected it a little bit, but we've turned a focus on that. And it's a great spot out there, and people really do use it. And so we're, we're proud of that one. Of course, the crash show. If you don't know, it's coming up Saturday. So uh, it's a big event that we're, we're part of. Obviously, Cheryl Heft uh, does a phenomenal job with it. Uh, she handles the vendors. We handle logistics uh, two shows a year. Um, our show is Saturday. Just quickly, uh, a couple statistics on that is last year we had over 400 vendors participate. Uh, like I, I said earlier, November show was our most successful show since 2008. The one thing that's really neat and we get a lot of credit for, and Cheryl started this, like I said, a program, is that we had 29 school teams and clubs work the show last year. It's a major fundraiser for them. So they work the show. You come in, you pay the $4 at the door. People ask, where's that money going? It's going back to the clubs, and we could not run those shows without the clubs and the teams. And those kids do a fantastic job. It's not just the sports teams. We have you know, robotics. We have everybody. So um, we're excited about that. We're excited to have those kids, and um, it's just been a great partnership. Uh, this is just kind of telling you what we do. Our program guide is coming out. We're getting ready for summer. We do mail out 10,000 guides every uh, time we, we do a winter, spring, we do a summer, and we do a fall guide that go out. And so our registration will be starting up here on April 3rd for the summertime. And these are just kind of pictures of our staff. You keep let people know we are here. Our Liberty Club camp, our summer camp staff, cultural arts, Pooh Corner, our facilities, our aquatics. We're all over the district, and so and sometimes people don't realize who we are and what we do, but these are just kind of some pictures of everything we are at Community Ed. That's our new garden sign, the volleyball team, our kids. First, and this is the last slide, and we'll take questions. I just want to first thank you, Board of Education. You guys have always, as long as I've been with Community Ed, have always supported uh, us, and I appreciate that. Buildings and grounds, custodial, we couldn't do what we do without their help, especially our large events. Uh, they're key, uh, especially the leads at most of the buildings. Uh, they're always, you know, Mike Puckett texts me today to make sure we're set for stuff on Saturday for the um, craft show. That doesn't happen in other districts. It does, but in other districts doesn't happen in. And so to have that communication um, is what makes our job easier. And obviously the principals, teachers, and clerks, uh, we, I think them all for support. I know sometimes if something goes missing or something's broken, it's community that's fault, and we're used to that, and that's okay. But they do support us. Uh, the support's great, and we appreciate that. And of course, the Sling community, we wouldn't be here without their support and um, with their programs. And I think that is it. Are there questions up and down the table for uh, Mr. Puffer? Go ahead. I just want to say thank you. Uh, we, too, appreciate the partnership with uh, community education, and you guys do so much. I really do like the Liberty Club. I think that is just an awesome idea. And thanks yep. for allowing those people. Yep. I was just going to say um, really quickly, I think it was um, before your time, but Lee was here when I was in college, and my very first job was <laughs> after school care at Pleasant Ridge. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, so that's how I first met Lee uh, many, many, many years that's ago. Awesome. Um, but uh, I just wanted to say a special thank you to a couple of people who've made a big impact on my kids' lives. So Rebecca, Thank you for providing the theater space for our dancers. Um, it is unbelievable, and uh, we hear from other dance studios around the state. I just was sitting next to a mom at a dive meet, and she was talking about her daughter's experience from a studio all the way over in Plymouth, and they come here um, because of the facilities and the care that you take. And uh, my daughter has always wanted to go to a performing arts school. <laughs> And I've said, you won't get anything better than this. So she's been provided with that because of you and your team. So thank you. 
And um, I also wanted to say thank you to Sandy for the aquatics and her team with Nick. My son just finished his dive season. <laughs> um, so senior mom thanks you for the care that you take for that pool and for the opportunities that you provided. And I don't know why I'm crying because I've been crying all weekend. <laughs> 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 I know it's uh, senior year is killing me, right, Tiffany? <laughs> um, yeah, so anyways, just the work that you guys do to maintain that pool is unmatched. And we go to pools all over, and um, there isn't one better. It's just, it's incredible, the opportunities that our kids have because of the, the care that you've taken for that facility. So thank you for that. And then um, I don't want to miss anyone. Thank you to everyone for the work that you do. But I especially want to thank um, Shannon Macy for the, for the um, Liberty Club such a special place and I know I think is Zach sitting there behind right that here. yeah right <laughs> Zach Zach Liberty Club is a pretty special place isn't it yeah it is yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah. thank you thank for, you for, Macy for for doing doing the right thing exactly thank you <laughs> thank you Shannon Macy exactly so um, thank you for providing that space for our um, for people in our community and for families to know that um, after their kids finish at age 26, there's a, there's a space for them to find um, meaningful and enjoyable activities each day. So thank you for your extra work. Um, so I don't want to repeat anything, but, the, the, but thank you for saying all of those wonderful things. I always think I'm biased, but I think of the school as the heart of this community because we have so many um, townships and everything, not just the city of Saline um, and, and our schools of choice friends, and you are our partner and our other piece of the heart. So thank you very much. Um, it really means something when you have that tenure slide up there. Um, that says something not only about the quality of the programming, but the quality of the individuals. So I'm gonna share one personal story. <laughs> um, I remember when Celine Middle School went to nationals for the very first time, and Coach Sandy needed to stay behind because she had made a commitment to a rental for the pool. Is that right? It was a, it was a big... <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. All right. But she, she, her heart was a little bruised that week. <laughs> yeah. But her heart was a little bruised. But we remembered her, and all of the kids made posters and sent pictures, oh, and awesome. she stayed here and took care of our beautiful pool. Um, so all of you are appreciated and know how much you contribute personally into the efforts to support the students. Um, it's really important that all of these programs. Um, the students can find their own voice, their own passions, they can try things out, maybe they like something, maybe they don't, and maybe they continue into middle school and into high school, and maybe they don't, but they, they gave it a try, and maybe they made a friend. Yeah. So I think that's great. Um, I can't say enough about before and after care. Um, in the past few years in neighboring communities, I know before and after care has been a conversation, <laughs> and we are very, very highly regarded for the, the services that, that we can provide um, being the daughter of a, of a single parent and relying on programs like that in the past, I think I've told you that, was really important. Um, and it is important for a lot of families, um, however those families might, might look. So thank you for keeping that open and keeping that running. Um, my question was around um, Governor Whitmer's State of the State, and she talked a little bit about pre-K for all. So I didn't know how that was going to affect us positively. Uh, in the district, so just wondered if you had any any thoughts about where we're headed um, with with pre -K. and Steve, if you want to jump in on this one too, uh, with pre K for all. It's meeting of the day. All right, I'll take that yeah. in that we we just met today with Suthan, Brian, and um, Kara Davis, Jackie, uh, Rex, Miranda, because we are talking about what that means. There's so many unknown factors right now, but the goal is to have four-year-olds have an opportunity to be, well, 75% of the four-year-olds in the state to be able to be in high-quality early childhood programs by, you know, three or four years down the road, 28, 29. Lots of questions about funding, um, logistics, making sure we're not putting daycare providers out of work. I mean, there's, there's probably more questions than there are answers, but we are dialed into it in, ter in trying to figure that out. Uh, as we move forward. Thank you, so so important, um, that, that strong foundation for the kiddos and keeping them in the district and keeping them mm -hmm. with people like you all who care for them um, so many different ways. So thank you. 
Um, my family has benefited from a lot of a lot of your all services, um, and that's a great question. That's something I've been curious about. So I'm glad that you are partnering and having those discussions yeah. um, about the, um, you know, finally um, <laughs> uh, having you know uh, pre-K and um, and thank you for the great start readiness program as well and. Um, accepting, you know, uh, spots for that. Um, I know that they, um, with the early childhood special education, um, kind of got to, you know, interact with that class and then, um, you know, the, the other daycare and everything, Poo Corner. Um, so I think that's a great partnership as well. Um, and yeah, just thank you. I can go on on a lot of things, so <laughs> um, great. Uh, very thorough uh, presentation, and thank you for, to your staff for showing up and coming. Thank you. All right. I'm just going to say thank you, like <laughs> everyone else <laughs> in Celine. Uh, you all have touched our lives as a family, and I appreciate everything that's done for the community. Uh, so no problem. It's all right. I, I I really don't have too much more to add. Uh, I just I also have benefited greatly. My family has benefited greatly, and we appreciate it. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm so appreciative of the community at is the amount of partnership the community has with our schools. Right? Like, not every community has a community at in a school district that function hand in hand. Right? And it just makes. It makes for facility management. It makes for all of these things that make us look so good to surrounding communities. It's, you know, our community sees us. They've experienced these things that, and then I'd like to think that then they're like, yeah, we'll support bonds. We'll support things because hand in hand, because now we're not only going to utilize that facility for, for an academic place, we're also going to be able to, um, you know, realize that and we're smart about like trying to realize revenues and trying to come up with different streams in that regard and and I think that really makes us different than a lot of other school districts and so so thank you for that yeah and I just cool last thing I just want to say from what Brad said is I work with a lot of other community departments and the support from the administration the superintendent is not there in a lot of places and that's why they struggle and so like what he just said is that's exactly what we try to do and we can't do it without the support from you guys up top so thank you I just had one quick question and then Dr. Lotcher would like to wrap it up um I really like the new sign but I miss the gazebo is it coming oh. back <laughs> I can't almost say yes won't say no maybe you know, <laughs> yeah we'll see that's a non-committal yeah. committal right? yeah it is maybe maybe not thank you I just yeah. I'm just glad it didn't burn to the ground no <laughs> no 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 no, no disappeared overnight. Thank you very much, Dr. Yep. Yeah, so I just wanted to add, if you looked at that presentation tonight and you see slide after slide, you're saying, wow, look at all the things that Community Ed does. And that's because over the years, you never say no to good ideas. <laughs> and you find ways, it's true though, they find ways to, you know, if that's a good idea, you, you, like when we, COVID, when we were trying to get kids back to school, our at-risk learners, we figured out a way to get them in session when our other kids weren't. The, the volleyball program, um, expansion of GSRP when we were, you know, one of the few districts that didn't do that yet. Um, and then eSports. It's just you never say no to good ideas. It keeps expanding. And it's largely because you have such a great staff that can figure out how to do all this stuff. So yep. I'm just very impressed as a superintendent at how well the department function, functions and will always take it on, whatever it is. Yep. So thank, thank you. you. Now you got to find a way to do another U of M cheer thing and, yeah. and it sells out <laughs> in under 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> That That's was like the thing. fastest <laughs> program of all time. Exactly. Everyone's contacting everybody. How do I get in? I'm like, I don't know. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, usually at the end of our scheduled reports, we don't uh, engage in a round of applause, but I think you need oh, it. Tonight. Well, thank you, you very much. Thank, thank you, guys. So I just want to say that the reason we are successful is it because of the leadership from Brian. And we, we go to the wall for this man because we love him, because he appreciates and respects what we do and supports us in every way. So I want to be sure that you all know that, because that's how we feel about him.
Thank you so much. We have one other scheduled. I'm sure it's not too much to follow in the tail in, 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 in the, the wake of these guys, but we have another scheduled report from the DEI Advisory Committee presenting an update this evening. Thank you very much. Presenters are Tiffany Alexander, Alice Kazi. Is it Kazi? Oh, thank you. Oh, excellent. Uh, Amy Tesselin and Laura Washington. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Laura Washington. C. With me is Tiffany Alexander and Amy Teslin. Unfortunately, Alice Kazi um, could no longer make it this evening, but she is okay. Just all is well there. Yes. So we present, oh, I already messed it up. Okay, f fix it. There we go. Okay, good. Um, so in May, we presented an update. Um, Shannon and Tiffany and Amy again presented an update to you, and so we are here in the spring to update you on the DEIAC work, to give some uh, an upcoming recommendation, and then to tell you what is next with the organization. So, we probably this should look familiar to you. This is the DEIAC organizational framework or the DEI framework with how we work in context with the entire district. So this should be again familiar to you. Start with the Board of Education and the SAS administrative team lined at the top. But if you notice the arrows going both ways, right? We take feedback and we also listen, and so that is a constant round of ideas so again it looks lateral but when you notice the the arrows you will see that we definitely are working in collaboration with one another um change to that is if you look um to ryan kerr's position has changed into the um, known as the diversity equity and inclusion specialist so that is a minor change in the in the framework so what is our charge? What do we do? So the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Advisory Committee in partnership with the superintendent and the board assess the current district environment related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We review and make recommendations to applicable district policies and procedures related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We assess district efforts and progress in achieving diversity, equity, and inclusion objectives. We make recommendations to the board regarding DEI initiatives that the committee believes will aid in the implementation of the purpose of the policy. And we try to present quarterly. I know we haven't been as successful in that, but I feel like we are in constant communication as we do have two board members that are um, that are attend our meetings as well so what have we been up to since October the DEIAC welcomed eight new members to the group so we are currently up to 20 members and two school board representatives the three-year plan came to um, we finalized it which is very exciting and I actually have a paper copy because when I show you the um, electronic copy, you're going to be like, I can't read that because it's too small. Uh, the three-year plan consisted of input from Sensei Change data after multiple listening sessions that we did last year, staff input, administrative input, and input from the DEIAC members. So there was a lot of input that came into the implementation of that plan. Subcommittee groups formed just this February and will begin working in March in order to make recommendations to all of you. So I will give you a copy of the three-year plan so you can see it. We will not go through each of the subjects tonight. That is something that you will need to keep track of. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. The objectives have not changed. So you'll notice that there are still five objectives. Structure systems, policy and practices, safety, healing and empowerment, recruitment, hiring, development and retention, DEI learning curriculum and assessment and community partnerships and communication. And actually a lot of the sub points didn't change from the last plan either, but some of them have been enhanced. We added some. We actually accomplished quite a few objectives from last year, so those went away, and then we added new ones. Again, I'm not going to go over all of the sub points. You can take that and digest it, um, and then if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to, to email me. Again, see, you can't, that was really hard to read, so you're welcome. <laughs> I'm over 40 now, <laughs> and I get this, so. So what has the DEIAC been up to again? And we've been engaging in conversation um, with 
the city of DEI, which has been really exciting. So Natha Kella is the new chairperson of the DEI, Celine, and he actually reached out to me in January and we met and is we're actually, well, Ryan is meeting with him tomorrow and he is planning to come to one of our meetings in hoping to collaborate um, with us and how we can not only become we, we can become ex more expansive in, in, what our, in what our goals are. So we've been listening to student voices. We've had students come to us. We've gone to different groups to hear their concerns and to, to really listen to, to what is happening both in, in the district. Welcoming and working alongside with Ryan Kerr, diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist has been wonderful and he has been implementing he's been doing a lot of listening and really helping us out in, in moving moving our goals forward and recommendations from administrative guidelines which you'll hear about here in a few minutes for our transgender non-binary policy are currently being worked on and that we're going to continue to work on that in march um, this month and then again tiffany and, and amy will talk about that here in a minute so what we do is again going back to our statement of what we what we accomplish and one of the things that we do is we do offer recommendations to the board and or the administrative team and some of the things that have come out of those recommendations are when you look at the hate speech guidelines we've actually we have met with administrators we met with student groups and we've aligned and strengthened language consequences in the handbook so that was a direct recommendation from the DEIAC given to our administrative team and then we have taken it from there. Building and protecting our SAS community was another recommendation and from that many if not all schools are engaging in community events which has been super exciting to see the energy um, and just watching people come together has been fabulous. The DEI statement made at most transition meetings um, after hearing that the high school didn't have their, didn't make a DEI statement, I went back and I talked to Musetta Deneen and she gave me some context, which was really fantastic. And we were talking about how that transition is more of a scheduling transition. And so how can we incorporate that then come the fall when it's more of an open house environment? Athletic and extracurricular handbook was published um, at the end of 2023. And again, that was a recommendation as well. Oh, I am so sorry. There we go. Uh, SAS gender neutral form signage at the high school has been improved, particularly in the pool area and the hallways. And forms used by educators are currently under review in most, if not all, buildings. The hiring and retention committee um, is reconvening in March and April in order to continue the work of the previously reviewed recommendations. So that is some of the work that has been accomplished. So what is next? I've already mentioned the administrative uh, guidelines for the transgender and non-binary non student policies. I'll let Tiffany and Amy take it over. Thank you, Laura. Um, okay, first, um, I wanna say thank you to the board for giving us this opportunity to speak and thank you to the rest of our DEIC members. Many of you've put in uh, quite a bit of um, content. And thank you to the many staff, admin, uh, teachers, students, as well as parents of the Life at SAS group, formerly known as the Celine Parents, Transgender Parents Group, um, in putting all of this together. Uh, it should be noted that this is a draft. We are really eager to get feedback so that we can get as much information from more staff, more teachers, more admin, um, more parents, because we really want these guidelines to be guidelines that work for our, for our students and for our teachers and for our admin to make implementing this policy um, as easy as possible. Okay, so um, this, these guidelines were uh, in response to the transgender and non-binary student policy that was passed unanimously, thank you, um, in 2021. And so um, along with uh, uh, asking for many of the families and students and staff, um, we're looking for more clarity in terms of understanding the policy and consistency in application. And so um, that's why uh, the guidelines are there to sort of put it into practice. And um, it was with the response, 
in response to the families and students and the policy, but also the Sensei report did also um, bring up these issues as well as the listening sessions. Um, yeah, why don't we just move this over so we can <laughs> stop yeah, doing this point. weird little <laughs> dance here. There we go. Okay. So then, um, yeah. So uh, this guide, the guidelines are written based uh, only on what is in the policy. The information provided comes from a combination of GLSEN, it comes from the HRC, it comes from uh, peer-reviewed research, um, and it comes from the input of our students, um, of our teachers, and of our, our staff, um, admin, as well as uh, other DEIAC members. So it's really uh, a culmination of a lot of input from people who have feet actually on the ground um, dealing with these very real world problems and with our students who are struggling um, to feel a part of this community and to feel safe. Mm -hmm. And just to add in the policy, in the guidelines itself, um, we have linked the federal and state laws uh, that are applicable and the SAS policies including the anti-harassment and bullying policies that relate directly to this as well. Um, go ahead. Yeah, just that they are linked throughout um, so that the language in all of uh, in this policy is consistent with the language in the uh, anti-harassment, anti-bullying policy, um, which was also a uh, thank you to the admin who recommended that. Um, then, uh, so the, the way this, this works is we have one very big comprehensive document. It is long, it Great. is, yeah, it's, it's very long, um, but it is, again, everything is in response to every single line that is in the policy. To make this more accessible, we have two slideshows. One is a teacher slideshow that breaks this down into what to do. Um, there are, will be more examples included throughout so that it is easy to access. I can go to slide number five, and this is where I do what, look at what I need to look at for pronouns. Um, to make it quick, easy access for teachers. And then there's an admin slideshow that has a little bit more information in it. Um, it's a little bit more comprehensive. Um, it includes some of our education pieces. Um, but again, it's a little bit more accessible, a little easier to, to get to, easier to show and break down things to parents. Whereas the, the overall guide has a lot of pieces on training and it's kind of color coded, as you can kind of see there, um, that talks about uh, education pieces, which is our why. Why is this necessary and where is this information coming from? Yeah. And so the, the slideshows are like a re could be used as a resource as well. And so um, because as we were mentioning before, this is a draft uh, right now and we're looking for we're still looking for continued input and we're bringing it back to the DIAC for more input as well um, lots of work and we want to get as many voices as possible um, so we can have the best guidelines that really work and so we are uh, going to be making final recommendations we're hoping for April or May and um, we're looking to the board to see how to receive, how you would like to receive those final recommendations. And now oh, and yes. if you have any questions about it, we're glad to either answer them now or ask uh, after Laura finishes or at any other time. I can wrap it up and then we can go on from there. So essentially, committees will, so the DEIC is broken up into two, two parts essentially. So first we meet in small committees and then we meet whole groups. So the committees will continue to review the three-year plan and make recommendations. We'll deliver the recommendations to either the SAS school board or SAS administrators depending on what is appropriate um, based on the three-year plan. And based on the function of what we're recommend it, recommending, and then follow up on action steps taken as a result of the recommendations. The group will continue to follow um, the committee charge and will continue to listen to concerns and be advocates for our kids and our community. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I don't know if you planned this or knew what you were doing when you planned it, but this is a good thing that adding the other two previous presentations to this one slideshow is great. One-stop shopping, I love it. So I can go back and make reference to the other questions yet. Oh, yeah. uh, my, do, my, my one question before we move on to the rest of the table is, how are you going about seeking, seeking input from the community? What are, you, what are you doing? What's your 
battle plan, so to speak? Yeah, so I think we have a couple things. So one, in terms of, like, for example, the three-year plan, that really came from the listening sessions that were that were held by Sensei Change. So um, Steve, everyone, all of you actually brought in that organization, and they were really, really helped us facilitate all of those listening sessions. So that is a great way of doing that. I know Dr. Lotch is also having, list, having listening sessions in the future, so I am positive that we will communicate if something comes up from that as well, and that is how we can seek seek more knowledge from the from the community base. One thing with um, Nath is he also, with the D, the Celine DEI, he also wants to be, or they also want to be as a group, more incorporative of the, our listening sessions as well. So not only will it be necessarily the Celine schools, but also within the community of Celine, which is something we've never done before. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll go uh, Susan and Jennifer and... Lauren. Um, so um, I'm one of the board uh, reps along with um, Jenny. Um, and so, you know, I get to witness all of the great work um, that you are doing and um, some of the, the conversations and confusion that, that goes on sometimes. Um, and um, I want to thank um, for the example of the um, transgender and non-binary students um, administrative guidelines. Um, I know a lot of work to create a super long document and also, um, you know, slides for the teachers and administrators, and I think that's super cool um, to have that quick reference. Um, I know it's been a long time coming and um, believe that it'll be super beneficial for the entire district um, and giving them tools um, at their fingertips. Um, and so, yeah, I'm excited about that. And then other recommendations that are, you know, starting to, will be <laughs> coming. So um, that brings me to, um, I guess, kind of almost like a question for the board. Um, so the committee charge um, that, you know, was brought up earlier, um, part of that is to, thank you, mm -hmm. slide four, right? <laughs> Um, so to inform the board on to how, how to continuously improve its efforts, oh, that was at the top, sorry, of the policy. Um, but, you know, a few of these, like, specifically talk about, um, reviewing and making recommendations to district policies and procedures, um, and sort of like what we witnessed in um, the presentation, um, making recommendations to the board regarding DEI initiatives um, and presenting quarterly to the board. Um, I'm going to propose, um, I know the committee is going to um, discuss kind of how, um, I think maybe at the next meeting about um, how everything um, functions and what, what, what that looks like. Um, so as far as like, recommendations um, to the board. Um, we typically get those in pieces or they've come to um, policy committee but not necessarily to the full board. Um, and so um, I think, I guess we have this, but what does that mean? So, um, you know, I think we should develop a process, whether it's a report um, given one of those quarterly, um, you know, uh, presentations um, that has all of those recommendations coming to the board. Um, and uh, so that we are, maybe we file it in consent, um, maybe we just accept it or approve it. I mean, it is advisory um, to the board. Um, so not necessarily saying like we're, you know, yeah, it, it's an advisory committee recommendation. Um, so, um, you know, looking at kind of Robert rules and looking at this handy dandy um, book, Becoming a Better Board Member from the National School Board Association that Michael McVeigh gave me recently, last year maybe. Um, it talks about, you know, committee charge, uh, citizen advisory committees, and um, how are those findings released, those recommendations, making them public, um, the board referring them to the staff administration um, or to, you know, board committees like, like the policy committee. And, but that not necessarily um, 
you know, impacting the work that's already be, been, that the district as a whole is doing with the three-year plan um, or those communications with within the DEI advisory committee. Um, I'm just possibly, um, I don't know if you all wanna talk about your thoughts, but maybe later make a motion about it um, of how we are receiving those recommendations. It, I, oh, I was just gonna say, it sounds like um, what you might be proposing is a slight revision to the policy. And no. I think, oh, to include process? Well, making recommendations, what does that mean? Right. That, you, you know, I mean. Maybe part of board operating procedure. Okay, yeah, so so policy or board operating procedures, and I, I agree with you that the process has been kind of a little bit hot potato, like where does it go? Um, nobody really knows. So I was um, thinking a revision to the policy, but even the board operating procedure either way, just so that there is more clear guidance on how the flow of information um, is received and so that action can be taken more readily. Okay, please. Um, I, c I would like to see the official recommendations come as a presentation to us about what you think. Like, okay, like, you know, you're a, a, an official committee and you're someone, you're, the work that you do is important. So I guess I would like to see it come through a formal process and come through like how we've been doing it. Now, to speak to, to Trustee Eastep's point though, you know, we accept as part of the consent agenda, I'm looking at it like policy committee meeting and, you know, meeting, finance meeting. And so if you were agreeable to it as a group, I think I would be okay with, um, allowing those meeting, like minutes from like when you guys get together and meet, I think that that would be nice to have in the packet and that could become a part of our consent. And then that really does give us some advisement of like what were the topics you discussed and who was leading those discussions and you know, like we get just a general like lay of the land if you will. Uh, that's how I would support that, but I'd like your recommendations to come formally, personally. Yeah, I, I, I think that's more for like public committee meet, like committee meetings and stuff. But yeah, that's a good good point. I don't want to derail the you know questions for the committee. I, I just um, yeah, I just know that's been kind of a pending thing and um, so. Yeah, and I know, and I can speak to this because when Dr. Washington was here, one of the things that we had talked about was where do those recommendations go, right? Because some of them definitely are board, and then some of them are SAS admin team. I mean, she was pretty clear on that as well, and, and, and we all were. And so I guess from you, what I would want to know is, do you want the 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 recommendations that are also going to the admin team to come to you first, and then we disperse it from there? Because right now, they're all in a folder. I mean, I can hand them, I know, you know, Jenny and Susan, you both have them as well. And so if that was something that that you wanted that is easily you know, easily accessible to everybody. That's not a problem. So I think it's just a matter of flow of information because, I mean, when Dr. Washington left, we kind of had to, we just, we figured out a, a new organizational system, which has been wonderful. And now I think we're really in a, a nice flow with that. So every month within our organizational system, we bring up if there are any new recommendations and we go over those. There haven't been in the last couple of months, obviously, because we're just starting our small subcommittees now. But as those come, yeah, just let me know how you would like those. And I'd be happy to either, to your point, you know, we can either send them out in minutes or give them to you in our in our folder. Whatever that looks like for you is fine. Yeah, I just, sorry, oh, she talked to me. Go. But, but just so you know, the, the, so there are two things, two, two baskets. Uh, one are uh, recommendations that would go toward administrative guidelines, and the other are recommendations that would go to perhaps tweaking existing policies or mm. perhaps even new policies. Those should come to the board president, and they will go to the uh, chair of the uh, policy committee, and where they get you know worked up and then presented. We have a process for that. But uh, so if, if we're clear on that, then I that's that's the like a next step. Sure. I th Think. I, did you want to clarify any of that? Oh, please do. So I do think it's important that we clarify how we're developing administrative guidelines. Mm -hmm. So the last several months, Betty and myself have been meeting with Melody Strang from Neola about a lot of relevant policies that we are now 
making sure that we're adopting administrative guidelines. And um, we've had multiple meetings and been spending hours on that because we're trying to make sure that we're capturing all a lot of the relevant policies um, in NEOLA that, that we're using now to develop administrative guidelines. So I did ask Betty to go and talk to Melody about, you know, there are other districts that have uh, transgender non-binary policy and, and we did ask uh, are there already administrative guidelines developed she said no mm -hmm. but then our process would be that she would help us develop them so they actually read um, you know an appropriate way like their other administrative guidelines do but we would take the recommendations right. from the DEIAC with us while we're developing those administrative guidelines it's just that administrative guidelines are developed by administration that we implement. So we would take those suggestions, work with Melody from Neola, and then Betty would ultimately put those administrative guidelines in motion. That, that's just, that's been the process that we've been using to develop administrative guidelines. I just want to clarify that. Yeah, and could we I, haven't had I, administrative could. guidelines public at all, like, it's not there. Right. And that's something I think we're really proud of, right? Because our, our job literally is to assess and to make recommendations. And so, you know, Tiffany and Amy have been working super hard on these. We would give them to you. They come back, you know, and then we, we can, you know, constantly work on this. So it is really a pretty fantastic working relationship. So, and, oh, can I, can Vice I, President I'm sorry, can I just clarify that, though? Because it seems like a bit of a waste of our uh, committee's time and effort. So how, how does that come full circle then. So if the team, our DEAIC, if we've charged them with making recommendations to write these guidelines and they're given to administration t and Melody at Neola to look at, then how does the board have assurance that the administrative guidelines that end up are following that the, the policy that the board well, no, that are following the policy that the board voted on unanimously in 2021. Like, how does that circle close? Well, we would, we would present, we would look at the actual policy with Melody, the actual policy that is currently in our board policy manual. It's about a four-page document that we would then go and match up administrative guidelines and how to implement all the parts of that. Now, I, I will say in advance, I don't know that it ends up being 23 pages because that, is, well, we may say that might be harder for the administration to implement in that regard, but we could be taking those suggestions and then putting administrative guidelines in motion that match up with the way in which Melody has been helping us do it for all the other administrative guidelines along the way in all the other policies. So wait, Neola does or doesn't have administrative guidelines for trans? I, they, I, do, I just, they do not. So how would, they what didn't, would they They be didn't using? have this policy either, but a part of their service to us is to review our policy. They have a legal team that makes sure that it's in, in line with legislation and, and laws, and then they can help develop these guidelines. So in the past when we've come to them and we've said, you know, is this anywhere? They've said no, but if you want to write it, we'll take a look at it with you. So that e even if they don't have it, they a part of our work with them is to uh, work with any of the new policies or administrative guidelines I that we have also. I have a point of information. Um, that's how I say it. Um, so GLSEN, which was what our transgender and non-binary um, policy was created from, actually, and I believe this was mentioned by Amy and Tiffany, um, actually comes first from, directly from GLSEN that aligns with that policy. So they have guidelines, and so that was expanded from that and included pieces from our policy um, where I think they took like the anti-harassment and the bullying and put those into place. So it is actual guidelines, maybe not in Neola, um, but that's um, that's where that was um, developed from. And, oh, yeah. Can I add real quick with the policy um, recommendations going to you and the policy committee? Um, 
sometimes, so that helps inform the policy committee's decision, but does, doesn't necessarily inform the full board's decision of these recommendations, because if it doesn't come to the full board, how are we, you know, making those decisions based on, um, you know, our advisory committee? Um, I think, you know, I, I want to recognize the work and the recommendations that are coming to them. I think, you know, it's a transparency piece and, um, you know, I think we're kind of losing um, what recommendations are going out there and how our committee and us as a board are supporting that and making the best decisions that we can with the information that they do um, give us here. Vice President Stebbin. Thank you. So first of all, thank you for the report and thank you to all of your members also who couldn't be here tonight, um, acknowledge the work. Um, just a couple of things. So first of all, I wanna double click on what President McVeigh said because I was about to say the same thing. If it's, if it's recommendations and a tweak to policy, the, the, the clear procedure is it comes to the policy committee. Um, so um, I think you asked, if you can go, um, the slide before the last one, or maybe second to the last. I just want to make sure you, you guys are getting your, your questions answered that you asked us during the presentation. Yes, right there. So your question on this particular slide, um, Tiffany, I think you were talking and you said we could answer the questions now or we could wait for Laura to finish up. So you had a question like what should happen with the recommendations on this specific policy. Was that your question? I just want to make sure we're answering what you asked us. I think Amy asked that. Amy, okay. But if you don't mind, I will take this opportunity to say um, one person I forgot to thank was Kara Davis. It was her who we sat down with and mentioned that this policy has been here for three years without guidelines. Um, so she never mentioned and we didn't discuss that there's already a policy a, a process for this being made okay. and specifically stated that this was not in, in the works right now. So that is why we we did this because it was not in the works right now. Um, and it's three years overdue. And as a parent of a non-binary child who is graduating this year and will graduate without ever having these guidelines, it was extremely important to me to see that this gets done expeditiously. Okay, great. So so I think, and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we have a, uh, a path for the administrative guidelines side of it. And we defin I definitely know we have a path for the side of the policy. Is that correct? Um, I wanted to just caution us uh, with regards to the conversation about the minutes being part of consent and things like that. I'd need to check with OMA or somebody else could, but I think if you have committee minutes like that and things that are being filed, that becomes an open meeting. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. <laughs> um, and then you all had also asked for just ideas on us giving feedback to help you in your work. Um, so an idea that I had, was, and you might be doing this already, is just making sure you're talking with lots of other um, diverse um, districts, and, and I, I mean diverse by perhaps geolocation in the state. Um, you know, we have roughly 5,000 students, maybe talk to schools that are smaller and talk to schools that are bigger, like all sorts of viewpoints, just to kind of um, get ideas uh, and benchmark against, I thought those were just my comments. Thank you. Any, oh, Brad. Uh, a couple of things. Number one, yeah, obviously OMA is a, a big deal to us and we want to make sure we're compliant with that. I mean, I don't care if it comes to our email as like some type of informational thing. I, I, whatever is legal and all of that, um, my thoughts are information is good, right? It's good for us to be informed about what's happening and all of that. So um, to, to speak to your exact question about what you'd want us to, to bring and do and all of that, I guess from this from my perspective, um, I want to. I, I agree that I think that things that apply to policy should come to our policy committee. However, when you're making recommendations to our administrative team, I also don't want that to get so bogged down in minutia and get so bogged down in like we only meet twice a month and we might need as an administrative team to support students faster than that. And so for me, like I guess I would say that I would like your recommendations that it can impact, impact students on a day in day out basis to go to where they're closest to the individual who would have to implement it and could do it the most like you said expeditiously. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time like I really would like to like I said get formal recommendations from the totality of all these individuals 
to us, and I don't care if you, whatever we have to do to be OMA compliant, mm -hmm. I'm all for it. But I guess that's what I would say. Thank you. And thank you for all the work you do. I know this is, it takes time from your life. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, go up. Okay, so I have a couple of questions. Um, my first question is, do, is there a list of subcommittee titles? Yeah, so if you look at the three-year plan, those are the subcommittees. So we have a sub subcommittee that's meeting under structure systems, policies, and practices, another that's safety, healing, and empowerment, recruitment, hiring, et cetera, et cetera. So it's okay. the five subcommittees. Five subcommittees. Mm -hmm. um, and then my other question is, how are metrics, um, be, are there any specific metrics that you're looking at with your team regarding, so if I look at the pillars, um, like are there specific so if I look under objective four, compare progress in achieving DEI goals starting with a 2020 baseline, is that some of the work that's being done in the surveys? Are they going to operationalize that as actual, like we would call them patient satisfaction measures, but right. I, you know, <laughs> like family satisfaction yeah. measures, is there going to be data shared? Because if we started in 2020, we're, you know, coming up on five years, so, um, I'm just wondering how we're going to be measuring progress. Yeah, that's a fair question. So actually, Ryan and I have had several conversations on what is qualitative versus quantitative data, right? Like, there are things that really do come out in a survey pretty well, and then there are other things you're like, Ugh, how do we measure this, right? What is that satisfaction? Who can we talk to? So it is a bit of both, depending on, on what it is. Um, Mr. Kerr actually developed a very nice root I just call it a rubric but it's it's a nice system for us to continually be tracking what we're doing and how we're going about it and and how we're moving the mark on some things and so again a mix of quantitative versus qualitative data depending on on what the sub and is is, is that going to be part of the quarterly reports to the board because I'd like to understand better what the sort of barriers to having, re I mean, beyond, you know, COVID and all that, what the barriers have been to having these quarterly reports to the board that were mentioned as kind of part of the charge of the advisory committee. Yeah, I think a lot of it is, I mean, I will own it. A lot of it is, you know, we, we meet once every month, right? And so like three months goes by and we're like, oh, we're already at three months and we're just getting going on something. And so it just hasn't felt like there was a time to meet every or to report to the board like we would have anything very substantial to report because this work takes time, right? It's not like you're making something happen once a month. It just, it doesn't, the work doesn't work that way. So it feels like once, twice a year is much more manageable and we would actually have something to say that would be different than than reporting quarterly. Maybe, but if there's four subcommittees, then maybe, you know, just hearing like yeah. what's going on generally in each subcommittee or looking at what the metrics are going to be would be interesting to the board. I think we're all kind of saying, or many of us are saying that it'd be nice to have like some more direct, you know, it's great to hear from you tonight. Yeah. I so appreciate the work of this committee and the team. And so I think it would be good. I guess my last question is for Tiffany or Amy. Um, and I'm gonna steal a page from uh, Trustee Gerby and ask, how can we at the Board of Education support the work of the DAC to allow for the most effective implementation of these DEI initiatives, which are pretty broad and deep. Um, so I hear, Dr. I hear uh, Principal Washington that this is a big mandate, um, but you know, breaking it into little pieces or bigger pieces, how can we support you and your uh, committee? Obviously, we can't speak for the group, <laughs> so we'll, I guess we'll try to speak just personally. Um, I think we're, as it's a new policy, relatively new policy, it's not like the sex ed advisory committee that's been around for a long time. I think um, definitely more, you know, clarity about the process is needed, and I think it is being worked out, and like you said, Shannon worked a lot on that last year. Um, wrapping things up in terms of, you know, bringing the recommendations to all the administrators. Um, and so, unfortunately, that didn't happen. And so that's why we're looking for more clarity about that. 
That part would definitely be what, what it is for me, what, to be able to bring, uh, I appreciate very much um, what Trustee Gerby said, is to bring our recommendations to the board. As we are written as a board committee, even if it is not something that is necessarily, we understand that what we bring to the board does not mean the board is going to be accepting, voting on it, commenting on it, or necessarily implementing it. But as we are a board committee, it seems appropriate to me, and that way we would have a clear path of knowing who has our recommendations um, and that they always have them. And as subcommittees want to report out, you know, I, some people may not be comfortable presenting and that's fine, but that that gets presented to the board. Um, we understand that it's just something that you would receive, not necessarily something that you would implement, and we completely accept that part. Absolutely, so. and, and I appreciate that clarification. And before I pass this over to, to uh, Vice President Stevan, I just want to say when we created this policy for X years ago, we didn't know the uh, scope and the breadth uh, mm -hmm. of your work, so three months, we just pulled three mm -hmm. months out of a hat. Just so, so don't feel badly mm -hmm. that you didn't make three months, but to, to Dr. Gold's point, it would be nice to hear, you know, even if they're very short updates uh, uh, every three months or so, that would be very helpful. But I would love to see that happen. I recommend that we change that part of the policy, Rep share that with us. <laughs> I would love to see quarterly updates. Sure. Okay, so here's course. what I'd recommend, and it, it doesn't mean changing the policy, and it doesn't mean more work for you all, because I, I want to acknowledge the comment about this work doesn't work like that, that, that you know, one month, here's what we've done. Um, when the policy says quarterly reports, it does not mean that the report has to be a verbal and deck presentation where you're here two hours into your evening every three months. Um, it can mean a report. Um, we receive those from, from Steve, we, we get weekly updates, it could be all, all, all sorts of things, it could be consent, I, I would stray against the minutes from, from the agenda because of OMA, but it could be um, a, a report like Miranda or HR has, has done in the past. So just con consider that and then, and then what works for, for you with what you're doing. Oh, one last, uh, I think it's the last thing. Yeah. Um, so I just first I want to just um, commend the committee I have especially with um, Shannon's departure and the community work that she was doing I think the um, by having Ryan's job really be focusing on um, curriculum and supporting the school the partnership with the with the city is so smart and I think that we all know the research that that says um, that if we want to have real systemic change in our world, it has to be community driven, not just through the schools. And so I, I just want to commend um, the city group and the school group for coming together to continue the work of um, listening sessions and community um, growth. So I um, wanted to highlight that. I also wanted to just say that um, the, the committee itself, um, Laura kind of mentioned this, but um, in the time that I've been on, uh, appointed as one of the board people on the on the committee, um, not serving on the committee, but serving as a listening <laughs> agent, I guess, at the committee, um, that uh, the it's been incredible to me to get to know the people on the committee and the um, just rich and diverse experiences that, and perspectives that they bring to the work. And um, so I just wanted to highlight um, not necessarily who's on the committee, but just um, just for everyone to kind of understand that we have um, parents um, of differently abled children. We have um, we have gender inclusivity, gender identity inclusivity. We have um, uh, uh, I'm trying to <laughs> trying to even <laughs> racial and ethnic. Thank you. Uh, language differences. We have. I mean, you name it. There's a representative. Um, there are. Um, uh, a number of um, people who are immigrants from other countries and bring and bring that um, breadth of of um, experience to our committee or to that committee. And so I just want to highlight that that it's not um, it's not like any other committee I've ever served on. <laughs> so it's really been um, and I'm again I keep saying served on. I try really hard to sit on my hands and keep my mouth closed in those meetings as much as I want to participate because it is such a rich learning. 
um, and environment. So um, I think it's important for our community to know that that those perspectives are all included in the work that that the three of you presented tonight. Um, I also wanted to just say that um, I was thinking along the lines of um, of what Jennifer was saying that if if it helps the committee, we love to have you here and to present and to be able to ask questions. But if it does help the committee to um, to file some sort of report, not minutes, but a report, we can receive a report. Minutes would make it, you know, a conflict with OMA, but a report would not. So keep that in mind for the work of the committee and how the committee thinks that that would benefit the group. Um, and then the last thing that I want to say is that. Um, I think that uh, one thing that I'll, I'll just kind of leave th this note um, from my own personal perspective, uh, serving on the committee at the beginning of the, the time that this um, policy was adopted and the um, transgender non-binary student policy was adopted, that um, in that time, one of the things that we kind of touched on but maybe didn't explain clearly to you is that there has also been a transition at Neola. <laughs> and so, um, the work that you may have seen or may not, because it's sometimes really boring, but um, for people who don't love policy like Susan <laughs> um, <clears throat> and me and, and everyone who serves, but um, we are actually, because of this new representative that we're working with, Melody String, who has been phenomenal to work with, um, we are finding um, a lot of... Um, policies that were missed and getting updated or recommended to the board. So the policy committee has been very busy. In fact, if you look at the agendas over the last few months and even tonight, you'll see a number of policies included. Um, and so I don't necessarily think that the, the policy or the administrative guidelines weren't um, a priority, but it, it tends to be like a mountain of things that are happening. So I know it's something that Steve has talked about and having your guidance and your, you have that priority. That's the priority of your work. And so having your work and your recommendations um, to us and taking the resources, like Susan mentioned, like GLSEN has these and having that knowledge um, being given to administration for, for the work um, is, is really helpful because otherwise we're starting from scratch in a world that I said, like like I said, has this mountain. So by taking that, and that's the work of the advisory committee, is to take those policies and to take those um, ideas and to help to collect those resources and then to um, and then to pass those to administrative team for administrative guidelines or policy team or however it might go, finance team for finances, et cetera. So um, I just wanna say that I appreciate the work that you're doing and I appreciate that you brought it forward. <clears throat> wanted to add that you know I I mean I sort of have a vision of how this should work eventually and and I know that it's you know real world real world problems get involved in all kinds of things like that but the point of the committee is to to provide the expertise that the district does not have right in terms of experiences and also there's a lot of people who actually have like degrees in this and you know work experience as well and so it's supposed to be you know a very um, enhancing experience you know so that so that it can it can make all of you know, all of the administrators, all the staff and teachers' jobs easier, not harder. <laughs> so that's the, that's the way it, it um, you know, we hope that it works. And that's what we're trying to figure out the best ways, the most efficient, you know, procedures for that. And I guess that's why I was, that, that's what I, I envision it to be too. And maybe we're a little clunky in getting the procedures worked out, but I do see the um, the advice, <laughs> the advisory committee, the resources and the expertise that you're extending is is what I thought um, an advisory committee could do. And I just appreciate that you're the, I don't know, for lack of a better term, the boots on the ground to try to get those things together and compile those resources so that it can be put into practice. So thank you. Caroline, did you want to have anything to add to this whole discussion, or did you want to wait for your spot just in a few minutes? Okay. Well, thank you very much to the whole team. We, when this, 
when, when this was, pro I think Susan was at that policy committee, when we first proposed this, uh, creating a, a, a standing committee on DEI, we, the main, main goal was that we did not want this, the efforts that are the, the, the challenges and the, 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 the imp policies that we implemented short term would be one shot only. We wanted this to be evergreen. We wanted this committee to be uh, a permanent part of our policies. And we, we knew that going forward, we didn't know what exactly the work was going to look like, but we really appreciate the efforts that dedicated and devoted parents and community members have put in. So thank you very much for all of your efforts. We're, we're looking forward to the next steps. Thank I, you. I was there. I dra drafted it. <laughs> you said you drafted it? So you're responsible for that three-month report thing? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to discussion. We have a few discussion items. Oh, my gosh. It goes right back to, uh, unless you want to let, uh, uh, you want to clear your throat for a second and let Brad go ahead of you. Nah, too late. We've, we've, okay. we've already settled this agenda it's earlier. It's the agenda. Okay. So, so let's go. Here we go. Um, okay. So the first thing is um, that, that uh, these policies that are listed under the policy committee update um, are not NEOLA updates, but rather new policies that have been recommended by NEOLA or revisions re requested by administration or a trustee. So the policy um, committee is asking that these policies on this list be um, added to the next agenda for a first reading. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview, but then after tonight, after this um, uh, update, I will be sending you um, my, um, my update, my committee report, and it will have links to each of the um, proposed um, revisions or new policies for you to review so that when it comes time um, you've had ample opportunity to review them especially since there are a lot of them so okay so first um, policy 5113 st this is the policy that Steve um, previewed for us earlier today this is a policy that we have currently standing but when we looked or when Steve actually looked um, at the policy and um, and uh, conferred with uh, legal uh, the change that is being recommended is consistent with the practice in the district and the law. So um, when you get this policy, you'll see in red and green that the change is very subtle. It says, is not available. Now it will say, may not be available. And what Steve was talking about is that in the past, we've said that a student who had had um, disciplinary issues, um, such as expulsion or legal um, issues, would not be um available for a school of choice, but that is not consistent with the law. So um, the change is that it may not be available, but um, not a definitive. I, I think Go I ahead. To clarify. Yeah. So actually what it says in the State School Aid Act, uh, 388.1705, that's county non-resident pupils, it specifically says, uh, let's see here, um, number nine. Uh, a district may refuse to enroll a non-resident applicant if any of the following are met. And the first one says the applicant is or has been within the preceding two years suspended from another school. I do want to point out, I've never taken a expelled student from another district. However, I'm also trying to not freeze people in time. So what I have done in the past, if um, on a school of choice application, it is checked that the student has a discipline issue or had an issue, I call the building or the superintendent and I find out what specifically has happened. And then there's been times where I've said, okay, we're not going to take that student. But there have been some other times where I have um, taken, and I, I know for sure, two different circumstances, and the kids have been flourishing in the district. So that, that's why I, I think we should be consistent with the language that says may. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to put that in context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and you you consulted with, right? You consulted with Jennifer Star Starling. Is that who it was, or just with well, this, this legal document? With the legal document, yeah. The, with the le okay, the legislation. The thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, oh, go ahead. So I had a, the way I, I was reading it. I felt like it could also mean that you won't accept 
accept them. So the new language would say that it may not be available instead of is not available. So it's still, the may changes it to that it could still be considered, but it might not be. So it just changes it from a definitive is not to may not. Um, and it is something that particular checkbox on the form is something that um, would have to be, like Steve just explained, that if that's checked on the form, he does have to do more in-depth yeah, um, I, just the wording of, of it. Like, it may not be available to them. Like, I I, I could read it in a different... I, I read it in a different way at first, so I, I don't know if that possibly... How does the legislation read? Yeah. May. Mm-hmm. May not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so policy 8300, um, continuity of organizational operations plan, often um, sometimes called COOP, Um, This is a policy that would be new to us. It was originally um, drafted by NEOLA in 2021, um, and it is a policy, and and again, this was the meeting (laughs) that I was not at, so please chime in. Um, But uh, this is a policy that um, is required to be added to board policy to be consistent with, um, with law, and It involves our school safety plan, partnerships with law enforcement, um, required reporting, and threat assessment. Um, The one question that I did have on this, and and perhaps Steve has has an answer for this, is that there is a spot in the drafted policy that has a spot for a liaison. So when we do accept the, um, the policy, we'd need to name that liaison there or or position. It's right, kind of and we sp- we spoke about how, like, currently, director of operations yes. is overseeing safety and security, Perfect. so we wouldn't yep. put a person's name in. Just put director but we, of operations. We would put so that. we just need to fill in that blank. And then the other element of this is Jackie's reviewing this to make sure that we would comply with this. Yes. So. Okay. So, um, Betty, perhaps when we uh, revise that, we'll need to put in director of operations there. Thank you. Okay, and then, um, so when that comes to the board, that'll be in, in place. Um, policy 0141.1 is our student body representatives, and this is an update or revision that was requested by Vice President Stebbin. This would be a change in the language to include an option for two student representatives as we had this year. So we just want the policy to reflect that um, positive experience this year, and so it could be one or two. It doesn't necessarily have to be two, but it gives some flexibility. Um, just as an aside, um, Betty did let us know that this, although it's not a part of the policy, um, the fund that awards a scholarship is is only funded to award one, so if there are multiple, um, that it would be divided equally. So just a, just a note of clarification there, and Caroline, you didn't hear any of that. Um, policy 6152 is um, student fees and supplies. This again is a new to us um, policy. It was originally drafted in 2004 with revisions in 2021. Uh, I just saw a typo here in my report, so I'll fix that for all of you. Um, and this was requested by Assistant Superintendent uh, Miranda Owsley because this is the policy that the purpose of this policy is to be consistent with the district's preferred method of payment, which is RevTrack. So um, it doesn't specifically name RevTrack, but it specifically names the procedures for electronically receiving um, payment for um, a variety of different things. Um, and then, uh, policy 5511, dress and grooming. This again is a new to us policy that was originally drafted in 2009 with revisions in 2021. So um, this was first reviewed by the policy committee in 2022. At that time, the board approved accompanying policies for admin 1616, policy 1616, professional staff 3216, and support staff 4216. This policy is slightly different as it is for students. And so the committee paused on the policy at that time instead of bringing it forward with that group of policies um, because there was bipartisan support at the time for Michigan to adopt the Crown 
Act, which is um, creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. And so we wanted to um, make sure that any policy that we were moving forward was um, in alignment with that uh, potential change at the legislation. And so on two, on, sorry, on um, June 15th, 2023, Governor Whitmer signed the Crown Act to, to end hair discrimination, making Michigan the 23rd state to adopt this act. And um, so uh, after, that was, um, after that was passed, uh, we did have some input from the DEIC, which I will link in the report so you can take a look at the recommendations from the DEIC. And we also double checked with legal to ensure that there was no conflict with other policies and to ensure compliance with laws. We received support. Uh, Betty had checked with, with um, Neola, and so we received support, moved the policy back to the committee to consider again, and the policy committee is in support of this policy and would like it to be added to the next agenda for first reading. Um, so that... I have major questions on this draft. Okay. Okay. Okay, yep. I will take questions in just a minute. So then the only other thing, um, not listed here, but listed later in the consent agenda, you all should have received um, a memorandum with the three policies that are on the consent agenda. So that was also a part of the work of the um, policy committee as of late. So um, policy, yeah, we've been busy. So the policy um, on use of tobacco by students um, is, is there for you basically um, some, some updates to include not just um, a variety of products that, have, that are new to the market, but also different ways that tobacco can be ingested. Um, and then um, policy, um, uh, the policy on school uh, safety information, um, sorry? 8, yeah, 8400, sorry, I have a little print here, um, is revised to reflect um, changes um, required by amendments approved by the governor to the Sex of Offender Registry Act, um, SORA that you may be familiar with, and then um, policy uh, 7217 on weapons. Um, this policy has been revised to include um, references to the Michigan Supreme Court decision. So basically at the bottom of that policy, you'll see where those um, Supreme Court decisions are now referenced, um, regulating firearms. Um, so that is the work that the policy committee has done over the last few weeks. And I just wanna say thank you to um, Dr. McVeigh for stepping in, um, <laughs> for stepping in at the last meeting or two meetings ago um, when I had a fever. So thank you um, for running that meeting and to the policy committee for continuing that work. And then we met again last week um, because we've been busy. Um, we are not meeting in April um, to observe. Um, well, we had a busy, busy calendar, but also um, uh, Lauren let us know that there's a Jewish holiday and we did not want to schedule a meeting um, when, um, when she should be celebrating. So we are not meeting in April, but we will resume again in May. If there is work, I'm meeting with Melody um, and Steve and Betty on, I think we said April 1st now. Um, so if there is work that needs to be um, conducted before we meet again in May, um, we will doodle poll <laughs> and find a date. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the so work that So not necessarily the second Tuesday? It's not necessarily okay. because we are trying to accommodate. Um, we are, that is the pattern that we tried to stick with, but because of work schedules and personal commitments and religious holidays and um, kid graduation celebrations, <laughs> all those kinds of things, we have altered um, a bit. Also, there are months where there's only one meeting, so we've had to make arrangements for that. So, can I? Um, well, um, this is your report, so. It's, a it's under discussion, okay. right? Yeah, discussion items, correct? Yeah, I just didn't know who was. No, I, I just wanted to give her Michael the thing. No, I was just, yeah, yeah. with sure. Michael. Um, so, so I served on the policy committee last year. Um, and so I know the DEIAC um, gave uh, feedback and recommendations to um, Michael McVeigh in December 2022. Um, and I know that he took a look at that and um, answered some, some questions. Um, and I know in May, I know we were working on a policy for 
a long extended period of time and didn't get to some of the items. Um, so I had requested in May 2023 um, if we can get um, those rec you know recommendations and get that policy sent. Um, I went back um, to our July meeting when we made um, edits as a policy committee um, and they are not at all reflected in what we received in the packet. Um, so I'm curious if um, everybody was able on the committee to, to see uh, the DEIAC recommendations. I think this is kind of a um, good point and it would serve the board to have those recommendations too before making a decision on this. Um, so we can all use that lens. Um, so one thing that we, so a couple of things um, that we accepted. So Michael McVeigh had um, written um, a line and added to the policy um, and that was clothing that may serve to deliberately intimidate students is prohibited by policy 0145, discriminatory harassment, and policy 1662, anti-harassment. Um, so that was a proposed sentence by McVeigh, and I think we said it was good. Um, also, the feedback that we did receive from DEIAC um, was uh, inviting the, I mean, number one, uh, inviting the participation of students. Um, and then I added that I thought that we should check staff too. So that whole section, inviting the participation of, so it's option B, um, none of it is accepted. Um, and so, like I said, during that meeting, we said stu students um, based on that feedback and then staff as well. Um, and so that's not reflected in there. Um, and then there were some language wording mistakes um, that I offered and uh, we accepted, uh, which was under D, adding their own, um, where it's crossed out his, her own, um, saying their own, otherwise it, it um, makes, makes the definition or the statement um, different. Um, and then Yes, it says his, her, own. Sure. No, that is, but you need to add back in their own, because otherwise it says prevent the student from achieving educational objectives. The first section. Oh, no, I have my... Sorry, I have a, a paper document, sorry. Okay. Yeah. I think she's on page 14 of the updated pack, okay. public yeah. packet. Well, we talked about the extras, and then we came back up, so that's where I was looking Yeah, and then under E, um, the very last thing, um, if you read it as is, it does not make any sense. Um, so we would need to remove including, and we discussed this back in July, um, and actively was changing the document in that conversation. Um, so including needs to come out, and then weather does, because currently it says, um, no, not at all. Like it ends without regard to whether a student, sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression and so that's not reflected here. Um, let's see. Okay. Yes, please. So I think um, a, one thing that I'll just say is that, um, so I think what had happened was um, typically when we make changes to a document like this, it happens through Betty, but I think it was happening under Michael's personal documents. And so I don't think that it, translated over. So there's two different documents, um, which is just a, an error. So if, um, if it is, I think that what I would like to recommend is that this come back so that we can merge those two so that we have those changes that were recommended in July, because that is what happened. The linked policy is not the policy that was in Michael's um, 
in Michael's uh, documents. Yeah, I know that you weren't yeah. able to edit it. I think um, Betty, while we were talking, was um, was helping out with that. Yeah, I think it's because there's two different drafts here. So there's. Um, I, I'm yeah. all in favor of tabling this particular one yeah. until uh, you get yeah. the copy, the the, the drafts yeah. merged together. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. I'm for, happy to send my notes that. as well for the committee. Yeah, if you want to send send your notes also, because I do know, like it's we've had multiple months of conversation around this, and I think that the the uh, document that I just found um, from Michael is um, not the one that made it into the Neola update. So, um, thank you. Yeah, and if um, if the DEIAC recommendations, I have those linked for everyone too. I okay. can send those. Yep. Yep. So I will still include the um, the DEIC recommendations in the um, report that I'm sending to all of you, the updates, so that you can take a look at the recommendations from the DEIC since it was con since we talked about it this tonight. Um, and then uh, we will um, bring this forward again <laughs> um, once we merge these two documents. I, I just, as, as a new member of the policy team, I just wanted to go back and review the notes from last year because Susan mentioned a few specific meetings like July mm -hmm. and things like that. So I was going back, and it looks like it was it was pushed, it was pushed, mm -hmm. it, was, it was it was being um, a particular piece of language was, was somebody was following up on that, and then it landed back on December 12, 2023, um, saying it goes on the next policy committee meeting which it would have because in 2024 it went on yeah so we're kind yeah. of we we discussed it once um there were a couple of things that we didn't accept there but was um for example i we all had different versions of um what it meant to have blocked vision so we we discussed yeah. that but we didn't make any changes and, and jenny brought up an amazing uh point that um, inviting a student, for example, who maybe, um, uh, you know, doesn't have like a perspective that we do because of like culture um, and maybe um, being able to look at what does eventually come as far as like handbooks and stuff. And, you know, it's not required. It says invite the participation of. And honestly, inviting the participation of students, parents, and uh, staff right there, your DEIAC, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. who, who can help with those, um, you know, uh, guidelines or within the school building, because I know we've had students come up, and there's been, like, gender equity clubs created um, based on this very thing, so, um, yeah. but yeah, some things we didn't change, and then it would kept continued to be on, and I think I did mention that we had the wrong one linked, um, but yep. yeah, we never fully came back to it at that point. No, we did, we did have some discussion at our um, DEIC, sorry, not DEIC, policy committee meeting about um, the Crown Act and, oh, yeah. and um, like you were mentioning, the, um, Betty, had uh, Betty had actually asked about the blocked vision mm -hmm. and um, that this would not, um, that, that this policy would still allow for, um, you know, cultural freedom and like head, head gear, yes. like, yeah, head yeah, yeah. Okay, and thanks. I think I think correct me if I'm wrong Betty I think I remember that it was both like it was it was referring to the vision of the student being blocked not of the student blocking others vision so it's the wording is a little tricky there too so <clears throat> okay. I don't need know if we need to formally move to table this, but I think that it's the understanding of the board that we're going yeah. to table. It's a discussion this. item, so I don't right. think I think it's D fine. Brad? Yeah. I just want to make sure because I'm king of clean copy um, over the years here. So this will come to us then as a first reading yes. the next yes. time, so that then we can figure out if we want to make any changes, and then there would be a second reading where we would take comments and do all that, right? This, this is, is not this the first is not reading, the first reading of this one. No, this will not be the first reading of um, dress and grooming, uh, 5511. This is the first, or no, it, we are recommending that the others be brought forward to the board as a first reading, so a discussion item. So on the next agenda, we are asking that the other four be brought forward as um, 
discussion items, and then hopefully the following meeting action items. So dressing, so dressing grooming theoretically would be three meetings at minimum. At minimum. Oh, well. Yeah. Okay. okay. It'll go back to policy yes. first, right? Okay. It's, it's not even on the radar yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Were there any other discussion notes on any of the other policies? Great. Uh, well, thank you very much for your service uh, on this. And I will now turn this over to the Finance Committee uh, Treasurer, Brad Gerby, who's thank also you. the Chair of Finance. I, I, I am. Um, so I have a quick update. So we met today, and uh, we had a, an agenda where, you know, I, I would argue that like the first, not even argue, but just say that the first half an hour of our hour together for me was like a professional development session, if you will, with Miranda Owsley, right? Um, and what I mean by that is we did a deeper dive into, into the budget amendment. And the biggest thing for me that came out of that is I learned a lot about Act, Act 18, and local special ed funding and how all those things piece together. And, and so like, I, I will tell you personally, like I'm always learning a little bit more and figuring it out. So um, the first bit we did that, we talked about just, you know, uh, revenues and expenditures and, and where we are with regards to, to that process and, you know, the, the UAAL and, and all of it. So uh, like I said, that was the, the majority of the time that we spent was just figuring out, you know, where were our discrepancies with between the original budget, uh, budget and the amendment. And I guess what I would report back to the team is I would say that I think we all left that meeting saying, okay, this was, it, it made sense to us. Uh, please chime in if, 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 if not. Uh, we talked about, uh, you know, our, 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 our right-sizing timeline and what have you. And so we want to make sure we do that right. We want to make sure that we give the, the leadership teams and the people in our district the time that they need to, to figure out what are the best decisions and what are the timelines of that. And our superintendent is on that. And in May Finance, we plan to talk more concretely about some of those recommendations. Um, and then the last thing we discussed um, in... in uh, Superintendent Lodge already referred to it was this idea of pre-K and, and four-year-olds and it's an incredibly ambitious and awesome mm -hmm. goal of the governor to to try to get those things because we capture kids younger and we can we can definitely get them learning and, and make them hornets sooner. There are some challenges though as he indicated with some finance things right um, you know for example we talked about how um, there is a cap of 10 students per staff member, right? So, you know, that can create some, some staffing things. It can create um, some budgetary types of things. And so we're hoping that the government and the legislature will go through some of the things that they need to do and just provide those clarity things to, to Dr. Lotch, right? Like, I'm sure he'll be listening and, and learning more about it, but, uh, and I appreciate him doing so. So... And, and, and those are basically the things that we discussed today, and that's that. Well, thank Anybody you. Anybody have anything they want to add? No. Well, thank you very much, Brad. I appreciate that. Um, it's been a great pleasure to serve on the Finance Committee. There's a lot of terminology I need to ramp up on. Uh, I'd like to pass this over now to administrative and board updates. And how I'd like to do it this time is Dr. Lotch, then Caroline, and then uh, let's do alphabetically by last name. You can work it out in your head, or I can say Austin, Eastep, Gerby, Gold, Miller, Stebbin, and McVeigh. Who comes in from the end? Second from the end. Okay, I will start with thanking Estrella Lilly in particular with a for a great uh, FSAS Blue Jeans and Bling event. She put a lot of effort into that, and um, raising seventy five thousand dollars to support the foundation is really. Uh, incredible, and I also want to thank ben, Good ben Goodman over here because he put uh, together an incredible video. However, there were some audio and um, sound challenges at the event, so we didn't get to see it, but I'm going to make sure to include it in your Friday memo because he really did a spectacular job with it, just like he does in, uh, in all our videos. But in this one, he really captures the essence of what the purpose of the foundation uh, really is all about, so really well done, Ben. 
Um, I also want to congratulate uh, congratulate uh, the girls Washtenaw United hockey team. They won the state championship this weekend in Plymouth, and I was able to hand out medals along with our uh, boys varsity hockey coach and um, Teresa Steger at that time. And then I do have a meeting with the coach uh, tomorrow after school, Coach Winters, because there has been some debate about, well, how do we award varsity letters for these girls? We're figuring that out, and then we're also going to have them here at a future super, uh, superintendent recognition to honor their achievement, along with Boys Swim and Dive. They got second in the state this past weekend. So uh, we're really excited about that. Super exciting end to sports seasons. I was also going to shout out the girls hockey team, so it's super exciting that they're getting recognition. Um, I also wanted to talk about something that student council is doing. The voice committee has been working on a town hall. Um, it's really cool that DEI was talked about tonight. We're also going to be talking about DEI at the meeting at the town hall. Um, I've been compiling questions from students at the high school about what they want to ask, administration. Ms. Steger's kind of going to be in the hot seat. Um, on the 19th, we'll be asking her um, these questions during lunches, so we're super excited for that. OK, I'll go quick here. Um, so on uh, March 2nd and 3rd, the Selena Robotics team had their first competition, and um, they ended up 15th out of 40. but. Uh, their alliance number eight, they were the eighth alliance, and they ended up um, coming within two points of beating the alliance number one, which actually ended up winning the whole event. So that, so they actually gave the number one alliance the uh, toughest match. Um, human resource report again. I want to say a shout out to Dave Raft. Congratulations on his retirement. That's, that's great. Um, and then March 18th is the Bandorama at Whistling High School. If I can interrupt, I was told by Ben Goodman to go left to right because it's easier for him to track us. So, okay, right. thanks, Ben. We'll yeah. go to. I don't know how he got that info to you, but so that's a problem. So, um, so first of all, I I'd be remiss if I didn't also give a shout out to uh, the Washington United girls and the hockey team. I um, I'm going to give a special personal shout out also to to Adam, to Coach Winters. Um, that is a, 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 an individual who a few years ago just told me he wanted to provide an opportunity for girls to have something that they didn't have. And uh, I am just thrilled, I am proud, and I am so, like, I, I, I'm so glad that you are feeling that appreciation, and I'm so glad that you uh, have provided that and that you're a state champion. Right, like that is just, whether you were a state champion or not, you were a champion. But it's neat and it's awesome for the girls and great for our community. So anyway, so that's that. Um, I wanna say bravo again to the um, ethics team for, for joining us tonight. And, and um, also I, 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 I have to say like how much I appreciate SMS. You know, like that, my, my children have both now been a part of an environment. They talked about so many things, arts and teamwork and leadership and mentoring and high achievement, inquiry, curiosity. But the thing that they um, hit on that I, I couldn't express my gratefulness enough for is that I agree that there is something for every kid there, right? And so um, I'm going to be sending in cereal and I would encourage everybody else send in cereal and that is that. And so, uh, and, and, and that's enough for me tonight. Thank you. Um, so, oh, are we doing alphabetical? Were you being sarcastic? Uh, okay, I was like, E comes yeah. before G. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to pause for just a minute, though, and throw it back to Caroline, because she failed to, um, oh. to um, acknowledge her accomplishments at the state gymnastics meet with two of her colleagues. So... Would you mind sharing with us the accomplishments of the gymnastics team at the state meet? Yeah, we got to go to Grand Rapids, which was super cool for it to be hosted there. We had like a team bonding the night before, which was super cool. And then Jenna Griffin placed eighth in the state, which was super cool. And she also placed 14th all around, which was awesome. And all three seniors got to compete at states together, which was super cool. Yeah, congratulations. 
I wanted to make sure that you had a chance to get your accolades too. That's a big deal to make it to the state meet. So um, congratulations to you and uh, your fellow seniors on those accomplishments that I'm sure were um, not just, re they were realized this year, but built over years and years and years of hard work. And so. we can also congratulate Caroline for wearing her gymnastics uniform out in public and jumping into a tub of water. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Bad, yes. idea. <laughs> bad idea. Bad <laughs> idea. Uh. So um, with that, with that, I uh, wanted to recognize that this is um, Women's History Month and that March 8th was International Women's Day. So I, I was especially thinking of that as um, the women's hockey team, the girls hockey team was advancing and the gymnastics team was advancing and um, just the, the accomplishments tonight that... Um, I'm gonna, Suhani, Suhani shared with us too. Um, I think that uh, that the um, young girls and um, young women that are um, in our school system are being celebrated, and it's it's really wonderful to see both academically, athletically, um, creatively, um, lots of really great things. I am not going to steal um, Dr. McVeigh's thunder with the polar plunge, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pause on that so that he has a chance to share. I'm not going to talk about it. I've blocked it out of my mind. Well, then what I will say is that, um, once again, Celine uh, raised the most money in the state, and I believe at last count it was $27,500? 28. 28, okay. So um, a big deal there. Uh, lots of people uh, got, um, what did they say? We're freezing for a reason. Um, and uh, the, pictures were, the pictures were really fun of the costumes and the spirit. And, and um, I also wanted to just say that, the week of the polar plunge plunge was a spirit week that was um, that was designed um, around the theme of inclusivity and connecting. And um, if you haven't had a chance to see um, the uh, video that I think Ben, you created the unified basketball video. So um, the unified basketball game was a highlight, I think, for all of the students. It was an assembly, and everyone got to cheer on um, the staff versus students. And uh, Dr. Lotch was in stripes. Uh, that was oh, you did the Heritage versus Dexter one. Okay, so there was there was a um, inclusive basketball game at the high school, but then Heritage versus Dexter was at Her at Heritage or at the middle school. Okay, great. Um, and I think that that's going to continue to expand with um, is it is it called Unified PE next year? Unified Sports, but there's a special is that the P name of the PE class next year? So excited to see that happening. Adaptive PE. Thank you. I knew I had the name wrong. Um, I just wanted to also say um, I really enjoyed getting to see um, the Ethics Bowl uh, team tonight. I know that I say this sometimes, but especially proud because two of those kids were Miller alumni. So um, to Colin and Alex, it's just so fun to see like 10 years later <laughs> the success of these students and to see their moms here tonight too. Um, 321, March 21. So next Thursday, wherever you are, rock your socks for World Down Syndrome Day. Um, I wanted to say the report from the middle school today. Um, I know that they're doing a lot of um, different inclusion activities over the next month, including they mentioned the Rock Your Socks Day. Um, my daughter Lainey had an experience this year with the connecting class with Mrs. Marlott over there and the work that um, the work that they're doing with inclusivity at the middle school is strong and I appreciated that report tonight. Um, lastly, I wanted to thank um, I wanted to thank A.D. Mantha and A.D. Pike because they're everywhere. They're like, where's Waldo? Like, they are everywhere, right? So um, they were, um, uh, Mr. Pike was at the SEC <laughs> Swim and Dive um, meet, and um, Wes <laughs> just happened to go up to find something at the top of the stands on Saturday, and Ashley was there and brought her down, and she sat with us and got to cheer on the team, and we were sitting right next to Pioneer, and um, it will come as no surprise that those pioneer folks had their paper and pencil out and were tabulating the scores even though they were being populated <laughs> electronically. So they told us we got second place over DCC before the boards populated it. So, and, they, and I have to say as much, um, you know, I know Dr. Uh, A.D. Mantha would say, we cheer for our team, we don't not cheer for other teams. And I will say 
that the pioneer folks were doing that. They were cheering for our kids whenever it didn't impact their kids. Um, so um, appreciate that. In, in terms of sportsmanship, I also want to say that the highlight of the um, swim meet, seeing the divers and seeing the swimmers really realize their hard work and their unity um, over the season. But one of the highlights to me was when they, um, they, they won second place by one and a half points. And when it was announced, um, the third, third place team, Detroit um, Catholic Central, was on the podium. And of course, you know, it was hard because it was one and a half points. So they came down off the podium. And as they announced um, our team, the boys walked past the podium and went over and shook the hands of the DCC boys. And um, I don't think there was a dry eye in the stadium. And the announcer stopped and said, ladies and gentlemen, you know, paused in his recognition of our team to say, this is what sportsmanship looks like. So I appreciate that our coaches instill that, our parents instill that in, in our teams, and that it's demonstrated and realized. Lastly, I just want to say, because he's not going to say it for himself, because he's extremely humble, but um, Todd Brunty was also named SEC Coach of the Year, which is a big deal. So congratulations to him on that award. Um, I, I won't do the anchor, so we'll make Ben happy. <laughs> Where's the camera, Ben? Number one or number two? Okay, I've got six really fast things to say. Uh, I attended the uh, illiteracy, sorry, literacy at Heritage, Literacy Night at Heritage. It was an actual blast. If you ever get a chance to pop in, just even 15, 20 minutes when they when they run these things, they're, they're, they're a great hoot. Um, I was not elected to the MASB Board of Directors, but I do appreciate all of your support. I will be on the slate as the Legislative Relations Network representative for the Washtenaw Association of School Boards coming up. Um, and I've been told by uh, Linda Hawk, Get that uh, she's got some great ideas, and uh, one of them is I've spoken to somebody from Yupiat, Alaska. If you know Alaska, Yupiat's a tiny, tiny little fishing village. They have this great model statewide for a student advocacy institute, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm nudging the right people, I think, to uh, get Washtenaw to embrace that. Uh, I'd like to remind you all that on Thursday night, the 14th, there's a learning activity at High Point School. It starts at 7, and there's an RSVP. <laughs> email floating around, I think, from Victoria Westmoreland, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I was very impressed by Celine Singularity's open house last night. That robot is fast. His name is Coda, C-O-D-A, and it's a musical theme this year. And man, I, I actually had to record some of the robot's trials in slow motion just to capture how it picked up the little ring and then spit it out. It's That's awesome. A note. A no it's a note, yes, yeah, sorry. Sure. It's a whole note. Okay, thank you very much for the clarification, Dr. Lott. Um, also, I was impressed by the middle school students who participated in the Semla Quiz Bowl on Saturday. I was a reader. It's awesome. If your kids have ever participated in it, well, they're very brave. And finally, I have my ticket for Beauty and the Beast on Friday. I hope <laughs> you have yours. Um, and I'll pass it along to Jennifer Stebbins. All right, thank you. Um, because Mateo isn't here, I wanted to call out as we ended our sports conversation and season, I believe that they were the SEC champs. So I wanted to acknowledge him who isn't here tonight at banquet. So good, good reason. Um, and Caroline, congratulations to you on vault as well. Um, to amplify what Jenny said about Coach Brunty, also um, our District Coach of the Year, Kathy Mutter, for cheer. So congratulations, Kathy. And Boys Basketball, SEC Coach of the Year, Michael Merrick. So, so many great student athletes, so many supportive coaches right beside them. So thank you very much. Um, let's see, Blue Jeans and Bling has already been matched, are, are mentioned, um, $75,000, but what was the best thing is seeing Steve's outfit. I'm just going to throw it out there. It was fabulous. I had like basically a prom picture taken with Lauren. I saw Jackie. I saw Kara. I like, it was, it was a really, really fun event and everyone was in a, a, a good mood and Ben, thank you for all your coordination and help. And I can't wait to watch that video. Um, I know a couple of us were at the Shark Tank um, for Sarah Stuckey's classroom. I got to support her students both Monday and Tuesday. I felt like, you know how in the Barbie movie where it says Ken's Beach, that's his job. My, my little name tag said business. So business was my job. So <laughs> business. <laughs> 
So um, I got to talk to the students about um, investment strategy, entrepreneurship, um, marketing, and things of that nature. Uh, so infusing a little of my work life into my district life. So it was really great to see all of those. Um, also amplifying the, the, the science, uh, that was Biomedical Science Project Lead the Way with Sarah Stuckey. Um, on Saturday, I will miss the craft show. I'm bummed, um, but I will be attending uh, at the University of Michigan Medical Center along with some other high school students, including my daughter um, and other area high school students, um, the One Day Closer event. So this is to inspire our next generation of scientists, um, particularly uh, uh, minority groups, women, et cetera. So I'm very excited to support that. They're gonna learn about cancer research and they're gonna, um, we're gonna take tours of the labs and hopefully um, encourage people to keep up with that curriculum throughout their high school career, which is very fun. Um, and just the other little piece of personal news this week, I was appointed to the Celine Historic Commission by City Council and Mayor Marl. So I wanted to thank them for that opportunity. I'll have my first meeting on Thursday. Um, I think it's a wonderful way to give back to the community in a slightly different way um, and, and honor my heritage, uh, my family's heritage in Celine for the past 120-ish years, I think, or 115, something like that. Um, and I, I just think it's another way to kind of bridge um, our relationship with some of the counselors on city, city council and meet new community members. So I'm excited about that. Um, I think others have mentioned this um, during the meeting, but um, Women's History Month, and um, I've seen, you know, in the schools, um, some recognition of that, so that's great. Um, so I did not attend the foundation um, event, but I was in on that auction every year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so I, I did um, when uh, it was one with the, the theater um, classes, and so hopefully um, one of my children will take advantage of that this summer because um, they have some summer camps. Um, so uh, even though um, we weren't uh, able to attend the board reps, um, Lauren, Lauren and I um, weren't able to attend the CAB meeting, um, it, uh, there were some notes about um, after carefully reviewing the existing adolescent health curriculum, specifically in grades four through eight, uh, CAB has unanimously decided to begin reviewing options for updated curricula. Um, so they're starting to, to see what's out there and start reviewing that. So I thought that was pretty exciting. Um, I know some of the um, curriculum that we have uh, when I was in probably eighth grade is when this curriculum still it, like the current approved curriculum uh, was like created um, which is should be totally embarrassing <laughs> to the district when we're like you know best practices and keeping up on you know everything and um, so you know I'm glad that um, there was a unanimous uh, decision in that after reviewing like old school videos from when I was in eighth grade um, <laughs> so um, I think that that's good news um, and so uh, I'll be at that meeting on Monday and I think that's pretty much oh, I have my updates so I also enjoy blue jeans and bling and congratulate FSIS for a great event and uh, raising a lot of money for the schools. I'm grateful. Um, the board uh, has made a basket for the craft show that uh, Trustee Miller helped me put together with her teacher skills. Thank you. And Trustee Stebbin tutored me in the ways of buying it will drop it off for us. So anyways, it highlights breakfast and I'm sad I won't be able to be there, but um, I think it should be a great event. Um, and I really enjoyed uh, hearing from Science Olympiad and ethics teams, especially because that is just really cool and would like to congratulate the students on finishing another trimester and starting a new trimester. I know that's always kind of an exciting, stressful time of year and then new beginnings. 
um, with a new trimester and the last trimester for our seniors. So um, that's very exciting. And I had something, oh, I wanted to mention that I um, was really happy to take a tour of our special ed facilities and um, meet some of our educators and staff with uh, Director Musson and Superintendent Lodge at my request just because uh, it was really interesting as a trustee and as a physician, as a community member to meet some of the students um, from the little adorable kids to the inspiring Liberty Club participants and um, just see everything the district has to offer for our students um, in that capacity. And so I really appreciated that opportunity and was really proud uh, to see everything the district is doing in the special ed uh, milieu. And if people would like to reach out to me um, about that or to the board about special ed, I think um, people would be really excited to hear all the interesting things that we're doing. Well, th thank you to everybody for your notes and comments. Um, I'm going to forego the uh, little blurb about the consent agenda, but instead ask, um, entertain a motion to authorize the consent agenda as printed. So move, Stebbin. J.S. Kirby, second. B.G., doing a lot this evening. Relax. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. 7-0. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, items on the next agenda, Dr. Lodge? Yeah, our primary scheduled report is a threat assessment overview and what we're doing about that. All right. Great. Thank you. Uh, I believe there are no public comments. This, there is no public in the room. Uh, the next meeting will be held on uh, April 9th, 2024 at 630. I'd like to entertain a motion to enter into closed session at 9, well, we're going to say 930 for a little well-earned bio break and um, with the intent to reopen at, how long do you think this will take? About a half an hour? 20 minutes, 20 minutes or so? Minutes. At roughly 9.50, there will be no action taken afterwards. So, uh, for the purpose of superintendent evaluation, Section 8A, under Section 8A, a simple majority vote is sufficient to enter into a closed session. Do I have a motion? So move, Stebbin. J.S. J.M., thank you very much. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. And opposed? Okay, good. Thank you for your service. Caroline? Yes, have a good night. Thank you. I need to go get my charging cable, which... Oh, right, of course.
Thank you very much. We have no action at this point. I'd like to uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the regular Board of Education meeting on March 12th at 9.55. So moved. JS. So moved. Step in. Anyone else want to support that? Support gold. Thank you, Lauren Gold. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you so much. Uh,